Hey guys, how are you doing? This is Zeph from Z Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I am joined with a dear friend of mine, Lewis Goldwater. Lewis, how are you doing? I'm very well, thanks Zeph. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. So, in this video, what Lewis is going to be very kindly showing you in a lot of detail is how to make a traditional split hazel basket. Now, this is something I only came to learn as of about a year and a half ago. Um, and I've been aware of Lewis's work for quite a while. Now last year, at the time of recording this video, I met Lewis in person at the Bodgers Ball, which is Britain's largest green woodworking event. And he was actually teaching a two day course yep. to some students there in person. And not only was it the first time I was able to see one of these baskets in person, but I also had a glance into kind of uh, uh, Lewis's process for making these. Now we've been uh, frequenting since then, speaking, and what Lewis has very kindly done is allowed me to come to his abode, his woodland workshop, here in the county of Herefordshire, which is in the west of England. So we're more or less a stone's throw from Wales, aren't we? We are, yeah, very much so, yeah. Yeah, so we can see it on the horizon. We can see you Welsh people on the horizon from here. Uh, it's a beautiful location. Uh, and so what we're here now, I'm here for uh, two days. And obviously you're not gonna see two days worth of footage, right, in one video. And what we're gonna do is actually spend an entirety of two days because it is quite a lengthy process, isn't it? Yes, it is, yeah. uh, To make from a lot of preparation involved and then obviously into the weaving aspect itself. Now, this is something we're going to go into obviously as this video progresses. Um, but would you say this is kind of quite a traditional uh, process that you're doing here? This has been around for a very long time in some shape or form. That's right, yeah. And it seems to be, within the UK, it seems to be quite specific to, or uh, it seems to have survived very much in the sort of Welsh marches, which is the area from the north to south of Wales, just on either side of the, the Wales-England England border. So this, there is very much a tradition of it going back quite a long time, particularly particularly in amongst the, the, the uplands of mid Wales. Perfect. So I'm really looking forward to seeing this in process myself as I'm filming this for you right now. So what we're going to do, we're going to start off by looking some actual, at some actual examples of some baskets that Lewis has made. And obviously we're going to get an introduction to Lewis and the work that he does. Because Lewis works full time in and around the kind of uh, woodland environment don't you that's right so both in a formal environment and informal in terms of the crafts that he does so we're going to look at his himself and obviously the work that he does we're going to look at, at some examples of some baskets and a little bit of an understanding of what they're about and then we're going to get straight into the harvesting of the hazel the processing and obviously the weaving so with your kind permission Lewis I'm going to make sure that we cover as much detail as possible so that really you want to inspire other people to kind of keep this tradition alive um there's not a lot of information out there in terms of video format would you agree very much so yeah there's there's very little recorded um the people who used to make hazel baskets in this way are you know are very old or, or sadly have died and all we're left with really are a few examples of the baskets and and people's sort of history and knowledge of of other people who used to make them and maybe they had one in their their house or, or on their farm so they they, they, they sort of recognize it but, but the knowledge about how to make them is, is almost disappeared except for a, a few of us now who are really pushing to get it get it back up back up on the craft agenda and that's fantastic you're doing some amazing work as you're going to see in a moment the one caveat i will add is this is a beautiful woodland but it is adjacent to a main road so if you happen to hear traffic in the background then that is a reason why so without further ado i hope you enjoy the rest of this video where Lewis Goldwater is going to be showing you how to make a traditional split hazel basket. So Lewis, do you want to talk a little bit about yourself? What is it you do for a living? I work for part-time for the Herefordshire Wildlife Trust, uh, which is our county uh, wildlife trust. Um, and a lot of my work does involve uh, managing woodlands, our nature reserves, which are, are woodlands around the county, also some other, other meadows, etc. Um, but when I'm not doing that, um, my interest is very much in green wood crafts and uh, in particular in recent years, probably about the last three years, I've really taken an interest in, in split hazel baskets. Um, the reason behind that is because um, I know somebody uh, locally called Martin Kibblewhite, who might be uh, known to some of you as well. Um, he lives in a town just a, a few miles away um, and he himself took an interest in, in hazel baskets, particularly because there were very few people really who had an understanding about them. Um, he knew about a basket maker in uh, near Hay on Wye called Charlie Jones, and I've actually got one of his baskets down here, who was almost the last hazel basket maker in our area. So all of that knowledge was going to be lost, unfortunately. Um, um, Charlie was quite an old man. Um, 
and Martin said to, to myself and, and a friend David Coogley, you must go up to North Wales to, to find out from a, another basket maker called Ruth Pybus, who's an amazingly uh, talented, very skilled, great teacher as well. And she, she will teach you at least the techniques for making, the preparing the hazel for the basket. And it's up to us then to learn how to make our specific uh, basket that's specific to our, to our area that Charlie used to make, um, which is this one down here. So this is one of Charlie's baskets, um, very kindly on loan um, from his family. Um, it's beautifully made, um, it's very robust. Um, there's really really lots and lots of nice detail about it. It's a lovely shape. You can see it's got a lovely kind of Partly rounded, but also partly um, sort of straight sides. So it's got nice handles you can see so it's great to carry good to carry along along your side um, And this is probably well, we think it's a probably about 30 to 40 years old um, There's a little bit of woodworm in there, um, but otherwise it's a really really nice basket. I don't use it myself um, I think it's too precious really um, but I, you know, if I could make baskets as good as this, then I would be very, very happy. And what were they traditionally used for? These sorts of baskets. They were very much a farmer's basket. Um, so, if you can imagine Mid Wales, um, or, or throughout a lot, a lot of Wales, where there wasn't very much willow growing, so willow is, you know, is the usual material we expect for for basket making. But in areas where there wasn't any willow, you know, if a farmer needed um, a carrying basket for carrying. Um, grain or for carrying um, beets and fodder for the, for the uh, for its livestock or just around the farm for example around the house for laundry etc etc in the kitchen perhaps for fruit collecting fruit then this was very much a sort of convenient sized basket really um, the hazel was the thing that was growing on the farm so that's what they would use as the the material um, for the basis for making the um, the basket and it was very much a sort of a, a traditional craft of of the of, of, of farmers as well that you know they would learn learn these skills and, and perhaps make them when they when they're not actually out on the land um, perhaps over winter for example um, it's the best time of course to harvest the hazel as well so that's the um, that's Charlie's basket um, and I, I make some I've, I've got lots more at home I've got some small examples here as well to show you um, this one is the first one I made with under guidance from from Ruth um, more about learning the techniques more than anything but it does share lots of things in common with uh, with with of course Charlie's baskets and locally they were known as whiskets so I don't know if that's a, um, a word you would come across um, uh, spelt W-I-S-K-E-T uh, sometimes it's spelt W-H-I-K-S-K-E-T uh, whiskit um, and I think if you you know the earliest reference to that word I found is is, is back to the 17th century in some literature then and in those days the, it doesn't mean necessarily that it was a basket made from hazel but it was a word that was used for a carrying basket perhaps for stone or on, on farms etc so a round framed round bottom basket we've got one here that's um that i've already made a start on so it just shows you some of the the key components and a little bit about the process which we'll talk about later on as well so these are the examples here are these the kind of main shapes that you tend to work with then in terms of making the the split hazel baskets yeah um certainly the the, the whisket um is, is very much sort of this this shape um, but i also make um, a variety of other designs as well so split hazel can be applied to other types of um, design of baskets so i've got ones with carrying handles um, i've got small ones which are called swallow baskets they they, they, they resemble um, swallows nests um, perhaps we might see some examples of those uh, later on um, there's a limit to what you can do with the type of weaving you can do but actually I'm, I'm quite excited by the idea of finding new new methods new ways of of using using split hazel um, it's actually a very incredibly strong material and, and you know I've, I've thought even about perhaps doing seat weaving for chairs using split hazel that's something which um, which I you know I'd quite like to try out as well for, just to see how how it compares with other methods of, of weaving So Lewis, we're now going to get into the actual process itself of making. Now, the first step I believe we need to do is obviously go and harvest the hazel. So how are we going to approach that next step? Well, we're going to go to, over to a, um, a woodland which I help to manage as part of the, the Herefordshire Wildlife Trust. My job with them is to, is to look after this particular woodland. It's, um, it's under, under management. It's one where we've got permission to, to go there and to actually uh, cut some hazel. Um, you know, I would always advise if you're going to go and, and source some wood, whatever it is, make sure you've got the, the landowner's permission 
uh, make sure that they know where you're, where you're cutting so you're not affecting anything which might be sensitive to wildlife or, or, or could be interfering with any other of the operations. So, so that's just a, a, you know, a thing to, to note really. But at least I know that on this, this site that we're going to, um, there's some, some nice examples of the kind of hazel that you, you will be looking for if you're going to make, make these baskets. And we'll, we'll get some while we're there as well. So for those watching, and obviously um, this is, I think, quite important. So for those watching, obviously the idea is to inspire people to have a go. Yeah. Um, so what is some advice you'd give them to, you know, if they were to go to a public woodland, for example, where it grows a red leaf in parts of the UK, um, are they just able to go down and take a couple of pieces? I mean, what's your advice regarding that? I'd be a little bit careful. I'd certainly want to make sure that you'd spoken to the owner of the woodland. Um, or it could be a hedgerow, for example. That that would that, you know that could be a good source. But but it's really really not you know not the best thing just to go cutting without first having asked permission. And then then you're covered, aren't you? You, you know you, you know you're not doing any damage or or, um, or causing any, any any harm to wildlife, etc. So so always do do make sure you've got your your permissions and your consents, etc. And you're not going to be uh, you know bringing any 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 wildlife to harm or, or anything like that. Um, and in terms of the cutting, is there any tips you give in terms of the cutting? Because I heard in the past you cut at an angle, uh, so it does regrow back. Is that true? Yeah. Um, you, when when we go down to the woods, you'll see that the, the kind of hazel that we're, we're looking for maybe not growing the sort of traditional coppice um, that, that perhaps many of you are familiar with. Um, I would certainly still, you know, take the same same approach really. And um, the way that hazel regrows is, is to to grow really uh, from quite low down. So if you are cutting um, a length. Um, a rod for, for, for converting into basket material. Um, do cut it low down. Um, you know you can cut it at an angle if it's possible. Um, take a sharp saw certainly, or, or a pair of loppers, which is, is what I tend to use because that's a, you know that's a good size um, tool for, for, for cutting. Um, and try not to you know try not to leave any any brash or anything like that you know in, in the way as you um, after you're working. Keep always tidy up after yourself. Um, but you know hopefully what you'll see is that the sort of hazel that we're looking looking for is fairly um, how can I put it? it it's it's not growing in the best conditions but it's growing in the best conditions for us but maybe not for for coppicing but still it's good to, to follow the same best practice and lastly is there a particular time of year that is the best time to actually coppice the hazel yeah that, that's really important actually that's a, a, a great question because what you tend to find is that if you cut your hazel in the um, in the summer so when it's when it's regenerating then you you have a few things going on you have um, a lot of canopy to, to deal with um, and obviously that is now um, that's you know that's that's going to get in the way as, as you're working so all the leaves all the small twigs that are, are growing on the, on the rods you know they've all come into um, into leaf so so that's that's an issue it's also quite sappy um, it's um, and that does affect the, the, the processing as well when it when, when there's a lot of sap um, rising that, that does make it the hazel a lot more brittle actually um, I find um, and the other thing is you, you're cutting midway through the year and what, what you'll see when we actually start processing is the importance of, of growth rings and that you're, you're you know you're, you want complete growth rings you, if you cut halfway through the year part way through the year and you're part way through the, the growth of, of one season um, and that won't produce the, the, the best weaving material uh, cut it when it's dormant the end of the year is really good, actually. So when, once you know, once it's finished growing for the for the year, for the all, you know, even once it's just shed its leaves, round about November time in, in this area, I would say is probably the best time. Um, but maybe any time through the through the winter until until you know, obviously until till spring comes and it starts starts regenerating. You know, cut before the, the regeneration starts. Fantastic. So the next step, are we going to travel over to another woodland to actually harvest the hazel? Yeah, we'll go over to one of our nature reserves. It's a few miles from here, um, but I know it's got the right kind of hazel growing in it, and I know we've 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 got the permission and, and, and the approval to, to to source and harvest our hazel from there. Um, so yeah, let's go let's go over and, and cut some hazel. So Lewis, you look like you're about to break into uh, an industrial unit. <laughs> but. Um, so in terms of the woodland where we're at, do you want to just talk a little bit about the woodland where we're going to kind of uh, coppice the hazel from? Yeah, of course, yeah. This is Brilly Green Dingle Nature Reserve, which is owned and managed by the Herefordshire Wildlife Trust, who I actually work for part-time as well. So we've got permission to, to film here and to coppice hazel here. Now, the, the woodland is a mix of areas of coppice and areas of non-intervention, which means that we don't really do any work there um, actively uh, to manage the woodland. 
but from the point of view of the basket making and the materials we need for our basket I'm going to show you the difference between the kind of hazel you'll get from a coppiced area and the kind of hazel which actually is better for basket making from a really kind of shady non-intervention area so we'll, uh, we'll go and, uh, and have a look at that now. So Lewis what are we looking at over here? Okay well I wanted to show you an example of hazel which probably wouldn't be suitable for for our basket. Now this actually has grown um, from some coppicing that was done about four years ago so you've got that you've got four years worth of regeneration of hazel which for some purposes would be really fantastic but for us what you'll find is it's actually grown too quickly so you can see it's probably the right length and right diameter for for converting into basket making material but it's grown too quickly um, the other thing that you'll notice is there's lots of side branches coming out and that's because it's got exposure to, to lots of light through the coppicing um, now we can give you a, I can demonstrate um, that it has grown too quickly if we can have a look at the, the growth rings we'll cut one stem and actually have a look at the, the growth rings on it and see that they're, they're really too, too broad for our, our purposes. Okay, can you see this? We've got one, two, three, four years worth of growth. So this is the right diameter for what we'd use for making our baskets, but those growth rings are really just too broad. And you can see, especially in the year one and two, it grew really quickly. Now what the problem there is that when we take off our weaving material, it, um, which is the outer growth ring, that will then be, just be too thick really for, for weaving into the basket. You want something which is quite thin and quite pliable because it's gonna, it's gonna be woven back and forward and, and, and bent, bent right over the, the top of the basket. So this is really too, uh, too fast grown. So just to kind of recap then, when you're looking for a hazel, um, are you looking for something that's grown in shade um, and not in an open space, basically? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that will make the, the, best, um, the best weaving material. Now that the hazel will actually produce shoots which are um, over time will become this this size they will be growing very tall because they need to reach that little bit of light um, that's up there in, in the canopy uh, here um, it's too open it's getting constantly lots and lots of illumination but the best hazel for basket making has been growing in the shade the, the hazel itself has put all its energy into growing tall and straight and not putting on really thick um, growth rings and that reflects also the um, the amount of canopy it has because obviously the more canopy that the um, a tree has the, the the more it can convert into into um, you know into into biomass and growth rings whereas a hazel that's grown in the shade really hasn't got a lot of canopy so it, it has to put its energy more into growing tall towards the light um, rather than growing uh, br um, fat stems like this the other thing you might notice as well is the, is the colour actually of the stems and, and this often, this kind of greeny brown purple colour um, you often get growing on hazel which has got lots and lots of light um, and what we'll see is the hazel that's grown under shade is much more sort of silver, much paler um, I think there must be a sort of reaction between the, the light and the, maybe the chlorophyll in the, in, the, um, in the cells in the stem to produce this colour which is actually really, really attractive but again gives you an indication that it's not the best hazel for our basket making So Lewis, have you found one that you like? A piece of hazel? Yeah, this is this is a, um, a hazel uh, stool. I don't think it's, it's been coppiced in the past. Um, it's a sort of natural, uh, natural coppice. Um, but what I'm looking for is a really a shady part of the woods. So that's important. So we've got a, um, a very high tree canopy that's fairly closed in. So not a lot of light getting down here. It's quite steeply sloping as well. So you know there's no light really coming in from behind the, um, the hazel. Um, and what I've noticed is this one um, has got some nice silver stems. So you remember before we talked about the, the sort of um, browny purple stems you get on, more on, on the open grown hazel. This one is, is much more silver. Um, so what I've been looking out for and I've found in this case is a stem which is 
uh, growing nice and straight. It's going from really low down, so we're going to get the maximum amount of material from, from, this, uh, from this piece of hazel. Um, it's grown very tall, so I'm standing back and looking up. Um, it's certainly still alive. I can see that there's buds um, at the top of it and there's, there's trees growing. Um, you'll also notice that there's no, you may or may not notice, but there's no side branches growing out from, from the stem at all. So it's putting all its energy into, into, into the canopy and growing really tall rather than sending out new shoots, which would affect the grain and the, um, and the strength of, of the weaving material we get from it. So what I'll do now is I'll actually cut it, um, try and pull it out. Um, I've noticed there's another stem wrapped around it as well, so we'll have to try and sort of pull it out from around that. And we'll actually look at the, the, growth, the growth rings and see, see how old it is. We'll count the growth rings, we'll see what we've got. Hopefully we've got a stem which has grown really, stri really uh, straight, but also uh, really slowly. I'm going to cut down here. So I'll have to stand back just to while we pull this out. Okay, I can see there's you know it's send up there's a few little side buds on here, but there's there's none of the longer branches really which are gonna um, affect the strength of the, the weaving material. But we'll just cut the uh, the top off it and we'll do a, a a ring count down at the bottom and see how old this one is. Okay, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So, one, two, three, four. Actually, those outer rings have grown really close together. Can you see? So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, possibly ten years old. This. So it's a similar size to the one we looked at before, but over twice, twice as old. Um, and again, I'm, I'm looking at the the rings. I can see that particularly towards the outside, they're really closely close together. Can you see that? So that means that in the last four or five years, it's actually grown really slowly, which is perfect for the material that we're, we're going to take off for our basket. Okay, I've got what I need. Um, I've got some more hazel already cut back at my woodland base. So uh, let's head on back. So Lewis, now that we're back at your outdoor woodland workshop uh, and we've brought back the hazel that you've chosen, um, what do you want to cover first? I just want to um, speak a little bit about the actual uh, makeup of the basket um, and it will help, uh, help you all to understand um, what it is that we're aiming for. So, um, then I'll say a little bit about the, uh, the tools and equipment that we need as well. So the main, this is one I've actually um, started working on some time ago, so it's obviously unfinished. Um, but it does at least show what the basket is made up of. The main three components are, you've got um, a hoop or a rim. Um, in this case it's made up actually of two pieces, two halves which are spliced together. You might actually just be able to see a little copper nail there. Um, in fact there's two of those and that's what's um, holding each half together. We've also got these ribs as well. Okay. And then you've got the weavers, you can see the weavers going backwards and forwards. Now it's actually the, the, the hoop and the ribs which really provide a lot of the strength and rigidity in the basket. And that's quite important because the weaving holds it all together, but you don't want your weavers to be um, more, uh, to be stiffer and less flexible than, um, than the, the actual ribs. So the, the ribs themselves and the, the hoop need to be a fairly rigid frame that you then uh, can, you know you build your weaving onto that's quite important and I've actually got some examples of, of those three components um, you know ready to weave in we'll obviously go on and, and do some uh, some work on these uh, much later on 
um, but you can see that the sort of size and shape of the, of the ribs for example so they're not um, they're not hugely um, hu you know they don't have huge um, diameters or anything like that or, or widths um, you can also perhaps make out the um, the approximate shape as well so that obviously um, fairly flat on two sides and, and also fairly thin and that's important because you want them to have some flexibility so that you can actually form the shape of the basket so these are are able to flex um, without breaking at, at all okay um, some examples of the um, of the hoops as well so we've got um, I've got two here one um, still has the bark on um, this one um, is where we've actually removed the bark um, as part of the preparing the weavers now the important thing about this is that the um, this is when you actually um, form this to a shape you need to hold it rigid until it dries so to start with it's actually quite flexible and elastic and it wants to spring back out to its original shape um, so you need some string or something just to hold it together perhaps even put it in a frame or a, or a mold uh, to hold it together until it's set until it's dried out um, because this has still got the bark on um, it will take much longer to set than this one which which doesn't um, doesn't have its bark on this will dry quite quickly in an airing cupboard uh, perhaps overnight um, this one might take three four days perhaps a, a week in uh, somewhere warm um, above a radiator for example um, but as long as they're hold, held in that in that shape until they're dried out then they, they obviously won't spring spring back and finally the the actual weavers themselves so I've got some which I've prepared some some time ago um, for another basket um, these have actually dried out and um, that's okay that um, makes it much easier to store them if you can coil them up um, allow them to dry out and then when you're ready to use them again just soak them perhaps um, perhaps overnight in, in a bucket of water um, actually wheelie bins are quite good in, for, for soaking them because you can really <laughs> really put quite quite a lot in there um, and, and fill them right up with water and um, thing to, to, to look out for at this stage is that some of the weavers have got the bark still on them um, and some don't and it, that just depends on the style of basket you want to make so this is this basket that I've already started working on you can see the, the bark I've, I've actually taken off and I'll show you how to do that later on but sometimes you might want to ba have a basket which, which still has the bark left on so this this one here you can untangle it you can see all the weavers all have their the bark left on um, it's just a personal choice more than anything as to as to how you do that okay I think we should get on and start preparing some weavers did you want to look at the tools oh thank you <laughs> very important. You're, getting, you're getting excited here Lewis <laughs> just wants to get making getting ahead of myself yeah let's talk about the uh, the tools as well now it's a fairly low equipment requirement for, for this for this basket really you could actually make a basket entirely just using a, a knife and I, I think that's probably how the um, the farmers back in the day would have done they'd have had you know one sharp knife that they used for the process um, I also have a pair of secateurs as well handy which is um, quite good for, for trimming trimming our, our hazel as well um, there's a few little bits of PPE which I think I'll, I'll probably mention as well now you wouldn't expect PPE necessarily for, for basket making but I think it's worth mentioning now a lot of your um, a lot of your weaving process is going to be involving um, using your knife I'll give you a very quick demonstration um, flat against your leg so you want something really to cover over your your leg so here's, a, here's an example of, of what I'm going to be doing you can see I'm going to be drawing the, um, the wood keeping the, the knife rigid and drawing the wood across like so and you not only do you want to um, protect your, your your clothing as well but also you know you don't want if the knife should slip then you know it's much safer to have something in between so I use just a, a piece of denim here from a, an old pair of jeans um, you can use a leather uh, patch as well if, if you want you could also um, a lot of you could also get some um, some knee pads as well because a lot of the work is going to be bending our hazel um, across our knee which I'll obviously we'll, we'll cover in a moment but it will put a, a little bit of stress and strain on your knees so a pair of gardening knee pads is is always quite a good idea um, as well and, and I find the final thing is um, your, 
your fingers are going to get um, a little bit of wear and tear as you're preparing the weavers. It'll become apparent when we do it that your, your, your index fingers are going to get a little bit of wear and tear. So I do tend to wear some sticking plasters on my index finger just to help protect the skin because it does get quite chafed and a little bit cut as well. Um, so that can, be, that can be quite handy as well. The one other thing I should say as well about your knife, this, this is probably quite important. Now I've, um, I've bought some fairly cheap knives um, from, uh, from Mora, the, the uh, knife maker. Um, they're not expensive, they're suitable for, for doing uh, woodcraft, but the, the actual edge itself is gonna take a real punishing. So if you've got your favorite, most expensive um, spoon carving knife, for example, I wouldn't be using that for um, for making these baskets because the edge is really going to um, take a punishment. It needs to be sharp, um, so this this cheap knife is actually um, perfect for that because I can keep a really good sharp edge on it. But I'm also aware that it's you know it's going to get dulled. Um, it's going to need lots of um, sharpening as well overnight. So um, yeah, I wouldn't use your your most expensive um, favorite carving knife for this. Uh, find something a little bit a little bit cheaper. So in terms of the preparation of all the pieces, where are we going to begin? Okay, we're going to start with the, um, the, the, our hazel rod, and this is the one we actually cut earlier on from, from the woods at Brilly. Uh, have a look at the, at the rod, and, and what you're trying to identify, if there's any of these little, um, I suppose you call them pin knots. So this is where the, the, um, the hazel, at some point in its life, has thought about possibly growing a, a new branch. And these, um, these little knots here, um, are sort of adventitious cells so given the opportunity they will send out a new branch but they're going to get in the way for our our process so we're, we're going to use our knife just to snip them off um, and this is quite important so I'm going to uh, try and show you this slowly we want to um, not so much cut the um, the, uh, the surface flush but we actually just want to take the sort of little scab off the top of it so I'll show you an another one so there's one there so I'm not going to cut it flush. I'm just taking, rubbing the knife just over the top, and that's important because we want the, um, we don't want to damage the actual, um, the the bark of the hazel as such. We just want to be able to lift the, um, lift the weaver over the top of that scar, uh, over the top of that, um, that little knot. So by just um, just taking the this, this very top of it like a scab, we we um, we loosen it up and it'll um, it'll it'll prise up over the top of that much easier. So keep working your way along. Um, there's a slightly bigger one, but again, I'm, I'm not really cutting it flush. I'm just just taking the very top of it off. Again, for the reason being that we don't want to actually really cut into the uh, into the bark and, and damage its its uh, its strength and the continuity of fibres. So keep working your way along. As you notice there's a little bit of um, a scar there, and that's probably just where the um, as the hazel was growing another another. Um, stem of hazel has just sort of interfered with it, so it's just affected the, the bark. But I don't think it's going to be a, a problem. Keep working your way along. Same again there. And also look out for any anywhere where there's a little bit of a, a kink. So here we'll, we'll probably bend that um, back straight a little bit more. It does help if the, if the rod is as straight as possible and has as few of these little knots as, uh, as possible as well. And this is primarily because it has been growing in the shade so that there hasn't been any light um, you know, falling on this stem in order to stimulate new, new branches or leaves to actually grow out of these, these little knots. So just working my way along. And we'll get up to the top there. Okay, there's one there as well. Um, it does help having something to put your... Um, your knife down on, your tools down on, so a little table or something like that alongside is quite handy, rather than having to reach down to the floor all the time. Okay, so I'm fairly happy with that. So I'll just just bend it slightly, and this will give you a demonstration of the, of the bending technique. Um, I tend to do it actually with my knees crossed, um, my legs crossed, but you don't have to necessarily. So just bending it just to help straighten it out get rid of that kink a little bit not it won't make too much of a difference but it does this actual initial bending does help to work the hazel and make it a little bit more pliable as well um, the rest of it's fairly straight so I'm not not too bothered about that and that's probably 
two, four, six, eight. Maybe that's 11 feet long, maybe 11 or, foot, 11 or 12 feet long, which is quite, quite a good length for a, a straight hazel rod. Okay, the other thing I want to just point out is, I don't know if you can see, you start at this end, Zed, um, and just, just to carry on, on along. And when you get to about here, you'll see there's a little kink. Um, I hope you can pick that out from the, a little bit of a sort of a, a little bit of a kink. And what's happened is I think that the, as the rod's grown from very young, it might have been browsed off or got a little bit damaged by a, a deer. Um, and it's sent out, you know, it's triggered it to send out new shoots. And you can actually see what I call adventitious buds. So that's, that's a kind of a trigger for it to send out new, um, you know, new shoots. And one of them has actually grown and carried on growing. But what it's left is this little kink here. Um, and that's not particularly helpful, um, particularly if you find them further along the, uh, the branch, that can be a weakness, so um, do look out for that. So we're going to actually, um, we're probably going to discard the first 18 inches um, of rod, um, and you'll see why uh, in a moment. Okay, so the first step is to cut a little, a little V-shaped nick with your knife, okay? And I'm going down probably, I actually want to go just underneath the outermost growth ring. And remember on this rod we saw earlier on that it's, it's, the growth ring is actually quite thin. Um, but if you go down probably maybe a millimeter, maybe two millimeters deep with a V-shaped nick, that's all you need to do. Um, yeah, the, the growth rings are, are thicker towards the middle, but they got quite thin towards the outside. So, And what we're going to be doing is prising off the outermost growth ring. So I'll just put my knife down for a second. Okay, we're going to um, start bending this over my knee. Um, now I'm going to start just slightly um, further along from that little, um, l that little kink that I mentioned before. Okay. And I need to use this first... 12 18 inches as, as a lever so that's why we don't start right at the very tip because we actually need quite a big kind of pulling lever in order to start the process of it splitting off and I don't know if you can pick out but I can I can sort of hear and just tell that there's a little bit of rippling in the bark yeah can you see that oh there we go it's, it's actually lifted so there's a combination of um, listening because sometimes you can hear it just kind of clicking a little bit and that means it's gone um, and also visually so I'm actually maybe I should explain actually the um, the bending is being done um, exactly sort of in line with the with with that little v-shaped cut that I've done so it's no good trying to bend it like that because we, we're not taking advantage of the, of the little nick that we're doing so I can't really see exactly what's going on but what I can just about see it looking over the top is the is the bark starting to ripple and it almost looks like a sort of sawtooth but that means it's the start of the uh, the process um, and what's happening is this bending this process of bending is is working on the weakness between the, the growth rings and it's just sort of shearing the um, shearing the two layers so if you imagine that's the inside and that's the, the bark my two hands okay so by bending it, what you're doing is you're just kind of sliding the two against each other and just kind of prizing them apart a little bit. And it's enough just to be able to lift, lift that outermost growth ring. So to start with, we'll use our knife. We won't need to use it afterwards, but um, we'll use our knife. And I'll just use it to just sort of prize it. And I'm not cutting at all. I'm just using the knife just to, to prize, it, prize it up like so. And then it'll go as far as it, it can. Um, don't, don't try and slice or go any further. But that's enough just to get you going. We'll put our knife, knife down for a second. Hopefully we won't actually need it for the rest of the uh, this weaver. So we've lost sort of, you know 18 inches or so to start with, but that's that's fine. Um, not that's not a great dif deal of difference. We'll still get sort of 10, 10 or so feet out of this. So I'm going to bend it again. And again, I'm listening and I'm looking for the bark just beginning to ripple that little bit. And I'm, this time, rather than using the knife, I'm actually sliding my finger underneath. And this is why I mentioned about putting a plastic, sticking plaster on your finger because it will get a little bit chafed um, by the hazel. Some people do react to hazel as well. Um, so it's probably best just to put a little, um, a little sticking plaster on there and it does, does protect your finger from wear. So I'm gonna keep working along. 
and the, the point of bending is slightly ahead of where where you've managed to prise it off. So you can see I've got as far as there. So I actually want to put the maximum amount of bending load round about there, about a couple of inches. So that tells you where exactly I'm going to position the um, the rod to, to bend it back. So use use obviously both hands. Um, make sure if you have got back problems, it's probably not the best thing for you to be doing, you know, because you're putting your shoulders and your back under quite a lot of strain. I'd imagine not quite a lot of um, old Welsh farmers have got back problems from doing this. Over, over many years but yeah so I can I can hear it just beginning to to ripple and sometimes it will actually pop it will actually ping off now here um, we've got that little scar and it has actually maybe you can't quite see but it has actually changed the shape of the hazel it's become slightly more oval than round so I think this is probably going to be slightly more difficult it might even want to slide off my knee so I'm gonna there we go uh, can you hear that pop, that little sort of click? That means it's just lifting off. And usually you can take off maybe four or five inches at a time. Now, one thing you might notice and be wondering about is the, um, is the spiral. So can you see, as we work our way along, it's actually spiraling around, okay? Um, that doesn't matter, that's all right, because the weaver itself, although it'll have a little bit of twist on it, We'll, um, we'll be able to deal with that. It's not the end of the world, and it's just reflecting the way that the hazel's grown. It's grown actually on a, you know, on a spiral, trying to trace, trace out those little bits of uh, sunlight, um, and that's fairly typical of hazel. You find it even in, in coppice woodland, in, in nice coppice hazel, it will actually grow on a spiral. If you're lucky, it'll grow dead straight. So we're going to keep working our way along. There you go, that's a pop. Um, and at some point we're actually going to hit one of these knots, so I'm going to explain what you do then. So there, it's not, not obvious, but there's a little knot underneath there, underneath my finger. Um, and it's resisting the, uh, the weaver from prising off. So we're going to use our knife here. And I'm not going to slice, um, just put the knife underneath. So it's not a slicing action, it's more of a sort of prising action. So can you see I'm just pivoting the knife not trying to slice through because the the danger is then your knife will slip and it will actually cut through the the fibers of the weaver which will you know reduce its strength so that's just lifted it over that little knot there put the knife safely back in okay so keep carrying on So there's a little knot there as well, but it's um, it has lifted off that, which is quite nice. And obviously the further along the rod you get, the easier it is to, to bend, but you can also overdo it as well. So um, just something to be aware of. As it gets thinner and thinner, it also becomes a little bit more easy to break. So there we've hit another little knot there, and that's one actually which we did actually prise the um, the top off before. So again, I'll just use my knife just to just to gently kind of lift it off, lift it over, just to kind of. There we go. And you can see actually that's where the. Um, the, the, the knot was growing. Can you see there's a little hole in there? Um, that's all right because remember the um, the fibres of this this weaver are still continuous either side of that hole. So having a little hole in there doesn't affect the strength at all. And in fact, sometimes it can be quite an interesting, quite nice uh, decorative effect as well. And we're nearly at the end now. In fact, you'll see the little peg that's left over that knot. When I t so when you get to the end, just pull it off. And can you see there's that little peg, that little knot that we talked about before. So by taking the, right at the beginning, by taking the sort of scab, the very very top of it off to start with, it means that the weaver's been able to lift over there. And here we go. We have a nice 10, 10 foot weaver, which is perfect. Get all, all tangled up. Okay, so that's our first one.
Um, I think I'll go on and explain how to take the, the next weavers off and then we'll talk about dressing them and preparing them ready to, to weave in. Okay, so your next, goodness, it is quite a spiral. Can you see how many times it's actually gone around the, the rod? And we've spiraled around maybe one and a half times, which is quite, quite amazing. It's just how the, how, the, um, how the hazel's grown. Okay, so there's your first, your first weaver. Your second one, you turn around at 180 degrees, so you're doing the absolute opposite side from where you started off, okay? So, same process again. We'll put a little V-shaped nick, V-shaped cup, try and get the knife the right way. There you go. And it's worth remembering as well that you're probably not going to get a weaver that's any more than maybe, what's that, about half an inch, maybe a third, you know, to half an inch is probably the maximum size width of weaver you're going to get using this this process you can you can get larger um, widths of hazel weaving material but the thing there is you're having to deal with a much thicker hazel rod perhaps about that that big which you physically can't bend just you over your knee like this there are other techniques you can use you can you can use a, a, a brake or something like that a cleaving brake something like that just to help help bend that but it's not you know, you've, you're having to put in a lot of leverage, which you're just not going to be able to do um, over your knee as I'm doing. So we'll, um, we'll do this one as well. There you go. So it's just beginning to lift off. We'll use our knife to start with. Can you pick up that, that rippling um, as it happens? It, it's quite, sometimes it's quite subtle. Sometimes you, you have to almost sense that it's going. You can kind of part listen. You might not even be able to see very much, but there's just a sort of very sort of dis slight distortion to the the bark, the surface of the bark, and it tells you that it's actually starting to shear off. There we go. So. And this one is also spiralling around. It's it, you know it's it's just something we have to have to, have to live with so I've got a bit, bit of a knot there so I'll just um, try and bend it a little bit more and then see if we can prise it over with our, our knife as we did before now that has gone but what I'm sensing is that that point there is a bit of a, a weak spot now in the rod it doesn't it felt as though it was just yielding a little bit as if it was gonna not break but you know if we if we overwork it it could could well break there but we'll see how we get on with this this rod I'm getting all tangled up there we go um, I suppose I should, should also mention about space because obviously we're working with quite long lengths of hazel so it does help having a lot of space to work with if you if you've got shorter lengths you know six seven eight feet long then obviously that you don't need quite as much working space but it does help to have a lot of working space when your, your hazel is this long um, it's also safer as well if, if there's a few people working together you know, just be mindful of who's around you where your hazel's going to go yeah so sometimes it, it does actually pop off um, Particularly the, the, as you work the, the hazel, it's actually becoming more and more plastic. And what I mean by that is it's, it's less springy. As you bend it, it's, it's, it'll deform, but it won't return to its original shape quite as much. Um, but that's okay. We can, we can use our, that to our advantage later on. Okay. Now you can see probably sense that that did actually break quite a lot off so I, I think we've probably just torn the fibers a little bit now this is something I've noticed that your freshly cut hazel which is what this is because we did literally cut it earlier on this morning is um, can be quite brittle it will um, it will feel as though the fibers are sort of more like to just to snap um, so what I often do is is leave my hazel for a, 
a few weeks. I suppose it's kind of a mellowing process, but it just just takes a little bit of the um, the brittleness out of the hazel. Uh, we want it to deform, we want it to bend, but we don't want it just to, to snap. So we want to keep some of that elasticity in there. Okay, so there's our second weaver, also nearly 10 foot long, which is good. Okay, and your next one, well, we can probably get probably a third, fourth, maybe six out of this rod, I reckon. So, if it's all right with you, I'll uh, I'll carry on. Let's go for it. Yep. Now your your third one, um, you know, it's quite broad there. There's quite a lot of width, so it'll probably go halfway between your last two or your first two weavers. So it's as if you're kind of going around the clock. Um, 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 3 o'clock, that kind of thing. So there's our, our little V-shape. Nick, let's see how this one lifts off. Sometimes it does help as well just to, you know, you've, you've been bending this, this, this rod quite a lot, so it sometimes does get a little bit out of shape. I'm going to straighten it up again if it's got too, too curvy. There we go. Can you hear that? Just a little, just ripples a little bit. You just get a little bit of a kind of click and you know it's, it's starting to go. So your knife just helps to prise it off to start with. And then we'll use my finger. There's no reason why you can't use shorter lengths of hazel if that's all you've got. Um, obviously that will just affect the, the amount of material that you'll yield from it. Oops. I'm going to get stuck behind my shelter pole there. So, occupational hazard. I'm not lifting it. Yeah, it's just starting to go. I've never tried this with um, the other woods as it happens. I'd quite like to have a go with perhaps young sweet chestnut or young um, young sycamore, um, but obviously you still need that slow slow growth rate. So it'd be quite interesting to compare different woods using this this technique. There we go. So again, you can see it's it's spiralling around. There's no no easy way of avoiding that. So there we've hit a little knot. I think I must have missed that earlier on with me just taking the, the top off it. So we'll just again just wiggle your knife. Just helps to prise it over the top. There you go. So we'll hit that, that scar again. Let's see how it behaves now. Might be all right. Yeah, that scar, it's just, it'll just affect the, um, the fibers on the surface a little bit, but I don't think it's too much of a problem. thin to being a bit broader here so there we go let's just lift it off we might be just reaching the limit really on this this one oh it will go but that that crack suggests to me that it's actually broken the um you know broken the rod there so we might find it more difficult to take later weavers off beyond this point because it's actually 
there's, there'll be less resistance to the bending. So it actually does help if there's a bit of elasticity in the rod when you're doing this. You want a little bit of resistance to work against. That's good, so we've reached the end there. Okay, well, we've finished uh, stripping this rod of all um, usable uh, weaving material uh, with the bark on. Um, I think we've got about eight, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, um, eight lengths, somewhere perhaps between 75 and 80 feet. We've got about 10 feet perhaps um, off, off each weaver and, and eight of those. Um, yeah, so that's quite a good yield really from one rod. And the actual rod itself, you can see, there we go. So we'll come back to this a little bit later when we start talking about ribs, but that's the sort of finish um, that, that you get. Now, I probably should mention that if your hazel rod is thick enough, you can actually take another layer off this, another set of weavers. Now, obviously, they won't have the bark on, but if your if the finished basket you want, you know, hasn't got the bark showing, then then you know that's a really good and efficient way of using of using that rod. You get a lot more weaving material uh, from it. But in our case, we're we're concentrating on a, a basket which is going to have have bark on. Um, so I'll show you how to how to prepare these. So we'll take one one weaver from this lot. Now I've seen. Um, examples of basket makers who who will literally weave this as it is straight into their their basket so they'll they won't be bothered about having a nice um, straight edge or, or or any of these kind of rough finishes this will be how it, how it'll be put into the basket but I quite like to have it nice and square and, and smooth it's just aesthetically it's more pleasing uh, for me so the first thing we'll do is we want this weaver to be fairly flexible and they always say if you can wrap it around your finger then it's flexible enough. Um, now I can straight away feel and a lot of this process of basket making is about feel more than anything. I can sort of feel as I bend that over my thumb that it's it's still got a little bit of resistance. Um, it's not all the way along so here it's a little bit more flexible but for the most part we've taken quite a thick um, or relatively thick um, uh, layer off, um, maybe a bit more than just one growth ring. A little bit of a tear there as well, so we'll have to do it. So I think what it'd be quite good is to actually prepare and dress all of these weavers. Now the first thing to do, as I say, is to take out some of the thickness. There's a couple of ways you can do this. There's a knife. So the first thing you can do is is to literally just draw it under your knife. So I'm going to hold the knife with the, uh, the blade facing down. So not horizontally, but facing vertically down. And I'm going to draw, I'm going to uh, press it against my, press it against the weaver and draw the weaver through. Now, if you've got a flat edge to your blade, there's that little tear. If you've got a, a flat edge to your blade, then what this will do is primarily take out some of the, the the curvature so it'll be just be cutting along either edge because that's where it's you know the curvature has, has raised it up a bit so that takes out some of the the thickness that's one one method um, try and start at one end and, and work all work your way all the way along in fact there I'll just do this end as well and just show you show you that again so you take out, um, just draw it underneath, maybe for the first so six or eight inches, turn it round, and then pull the whole length through. And that's quite an efficient way of doing things. So that's one thing. Yeah, there's a little tear there. The other way you can do is to actually rive it. And when we say rive, I mean split it into, into two thinner lengths. So we'll give that a try as well. I'll start at this top end and the way you rive this is not by using a, um, a, a, cleaving, a cleaving tool or a knife but you actually just use your finger so we'll start it off just by bending it over just to take that little bit off at the start and then 
rive it down. So can you see that? We're, um, I'm going to use my, I'm going to sort of form this heart shape with my fingers and thumbs. Can you see that? So I'm using my thumbs to prise the hazel apart and my fingers are stopping the split from going any further because if I hold it down there then I don't really have any very good control but if I my fingers and thumbs are nice and close I can I can literally feel which side is perhaps getting a bit too thick or a bit too thin actually um, now if one side is starting to run off so it's just going a little bit thin what you want to do is to pull it back into the middle so you, you might have a, a thin side and a, and a thick side you want it to split evenly down the middle so if it goes a bit too thin on one side then put a bit more bending on the thick side to pull it into the middle does that make sense so you keep working your way down see this is getting a little bit too thick so I'm just going to do a bit more bend it back towards the thick side pull the pull the split back into the middle or bend the split back into the middle and keep working your way down um, now the nice thing about this process is, well you can see you're actually getting two weavers for the price of one. So it's a way of doubling up your material. I mean obviously the weaver, this weaver is not going to have any bark on it but we can always uh, store it and use it for another basket later on. So it's actually a very efficient process. This, this whole process of making a split hazel basket is very efficient because, well, see we've, we've reached that little split so I'm, um, I'm going to cut it there, my secateurs, perhaps carry on. Um, it's very efficient because we use, we could get all of our weaving material, ribs, hoops, the whole lot out just out of one uh, hazel rod or a few hazel rods using every single part of it. Okay so that's the, uh, the remainder. Well, let's go back to the, the bits we've, we've taken off. So there's the one with without bark, there's the one with, oh, I've lost the one with bark. There we go, sorry. There we go. Now it's still got these rough edges. I am gonna, again, use, use my knife, but this time slightly raised up over my knee. You can see why I, why I have this um, protective pad here as well. So slightly raised up above the top, and I'm just gently drawing it through and just squaring off those those rough edges. So can you see that? So we've got a nice square weaver. Now, as I say, you do about six inches at one end and then turn it around and just draw it all the way along. This has gone quite thin, so I'm just gonna be extra, a little bit careful. And I'm also being careful not to actually push the knife in very much at all. I'm just trimming off that very fine edge, really. Angle, angle the, um, the blade of your knife as well a little bit so it's almost slicing. So angle it slightly and then it will just slice the way through. There you go, so just working, working my way along. It might go a little bit thin at one end, that's all right. I mean, in the ideal world, we'd have weavers which are all exactly the same width all the way along. Um, we, we can trim the bits where it's a little bit wide later on again. So first do the first six inches and then turn it over and just draw it all the way along. Sometimes you'll hit a knot and you'll feel that, that, that so there I've got that, you know, the, the, the grain and the fibres have changed direction to go around that knot, so I can feel there's a bit of resistance there. So, so just sort of gently prise around it, cut around it, and you carry on. Okay. Now keep working your way along. And we should end up with a, there's still a little bit more there, a bit more on that side with a weaver, which is much neater. There we go. There's just a bit more there that we in this first time around. There we go. So there, I mean, I accidentally actually did make it a little bit thin there. Um, so I'm just gonna very gently kind of even it out. 
It doesn't matter if it's if it goes too thin. It's amazing the strength that's actually in these weavers. Um, I mean, I'm really pulling that apart. I can't possibly pull that apart. So it's retained its tensile strength, which is really important when you come to to weave a basket. That's where the that's where it holds the whole thing together. And of course, you can now wrap it around your finger. It's much more much more flexible. Yeah. That's quite pretty. Um, there we go. So that's a weaver without bark. You can dress that in the same way, trim off the edges. Um, here's the one with bark. Now I probably should show you as well as we're as we're at it. We've got plenty more weavers, but I'll, I'll show you very quickly what you want if you actually don't want the bark on at all. So rather than wasting this, if I if I you know if I wanted my basket without bark on at all, um, I could strip the bark off, and I'll show you the the technique for doing that. So again, with our knife facing down, a bit, a, bit, a little bit like before when we were um, thinning out the weaver, knife flat down against the weaver and draw it through, maybe a couple of times, and that just takes off that that bark on the um, on the outside. You can also just twist it a little bit. So do the first sort of six or eight inches, turn it round, and then. You might have to do it two or three times just to get rid of all of the all of the bark. You can you can scrape it a little bit with the the blade flat. You just got to be really careful. It doesn't really cut into the um, into the hazel and, and take out some of the strength. Um, and and if there is any a little bit of green left in there, it will actually um, fade over time. Well, quite quickly actually, as a, the chlorophyll fades fairly quickly. Okay, so um, actually I'll show you an example of where where we did that. Oh, I'll show you this one here. So if you've got a little bit of um, a little bit of the cambium or the, or you know a little bit of bark left it just does fade. And actually I think that's quite a nice sort of decorative effect almost like a little stripe effect but um, maybe not for everyone but but yeah that's that's quite nice so that's how you would prepare a, a weaver without bark okay just got a little bit on the end there as well um, but I think for our basket we will stick to having the bark actually on you know invisible okay so with the weavers would you say that part is now complete yeah um, we've got as much as we can um, off the rod and probably enough for, for making our basket. You can always go onto another rod and prepare another um, an, another set of weavers. Um, if you produce too many, that's all right, because what I tend to do is let them dry out, coil them up. But there's, a, there's a coil of weavers down here. Um, and then when they're, if you want to use them again, then just soak them in water um, overnight and they're, they're pliant again and ready to use. Um, what I tend to do if I'm making a single basket is to keep all my weavers in a in a trug or a bucket like this with some water in, um, just to keep them pliant um, whilst I'm preparing all the other parts for the, the basket. Um, that can be quite helpful. But I think we'll probably go on to uh, uh, preparing the ribs now. Now I said quite early on it's quite an efficient process because we're going to use every single part of the uh, of the rod as best we can. Um, so we've got the core from uh, from when we've been stripping off off the weavers, um, it's nice and long, and we're, we're going to guess the, the, the length of the ribs, obviously it depends on the depth and the size of your basket, but I'm reckoning probably about 18 inches, something like that is probably about as long as they need to be. Um, I am going to discard this part um, of the rod, because it's got that little kink in it, um, and it will take a little while to, to strip the bark off um, using a knife, so I'm going to actually cut it into, into sections now using my, my loppers. And it's approximate length really, it doesn't matter if they're slightly too long, obviously better slightly too long than too short, we can always trim them later. Um, and then perhaps a, a cut there, and I'll probably aim to get another one again, another set of ribs from, from here. Now what remains is, again it's not going to go to waste. We, we could take another chop and, and take some more ribs from that, uh, but I'd quite like to use this a bit later on for preparing the, uh, 
the hoop. Um, so this thinner section is ideal really for, for the hoop. Um, but we'll use the, the, the thicker end for preparing ribs. And they're pretty much almost the, the right length. Now the first thing to do is, um, if you look along the length, you can see there's still these little raised parts here. I can certainly feel them. You might be able to pick them up on the, on the camera. Um, and that's just from when we've been taking the weavers off and there's just been a little bit of, uh, a little bit of wood left on there. So the best thing to do to start with is just to trim those off. And I'll use my, my knife again and the same technique as we did before. Okay, so we're gonna hold the um, piece of wood against our, our protective pad there and the knife flats this time against the wood and just draw it along like so. And again, a sort of slightly angled blade helps to slice slice through as well. And all we're doing is taking off the, those slightly raised uh, ridges. And it's, again, it just um, reminds you how how there is that little sort of twist as well in there. You can see that they, um, they do actually spiral around the, the length. Occasionally there'll be a little knot, so just with your, back, your thumb on the back of the blade, just push through that. Um, we're going to make it as circular as possible because that will make it as um, easy as possible to, uh, to to split and then cut the ribs from it. And this is just uh, another again another process of, sort of dressing the the wood before we actually um, process it any further. So I've done that end and I'll do this end again. And this drawing action is, is really efficient. You get a really good pull. You can use your shoulder, you know, the strength in your, in your upper body. Because if I, if I try to do it like that, I'm only pushing the knife a short distance and I don't really have very good control. Um, but by using your, keeping the knife still and steady and drawing it through like so, you know, there's lots of power there, lots of, um, lots of strength in your upper body which you can take advantage of. It's obviously much safer as well by keeping the knife still rather than moving the knife. So I'm quite happy with that. There's a, it's a little bit uneven in places but that's not a problem. So we're going to do some splitting okay um, and we're going to use again because we're, we're very tool efficient on this we're going to use just the knife. You can use a, a small bill hook if you want. You could use um, a, a small fro for example that would um, that would also do but I think a knife generally is is probably all, all that you need to to use. Now you've got to be quite careful here because we're going to be um, we're going to be using the knife in a, in a different way from how we've done it before. So we, we start the knife off on the top and you want to make sure as best as possible that it's right down the middle so you've got an even amount of wood on either side of, uh, of the knife. If you start off and it's slightly offset then this, what you'll do is you'll have a form a split that will tend to run off to the to the thin side. So you want the knife as best you can right on the top and can you see I'm going to use my finger on the top of the knife and my thumb is is right down here so it's right out of the way so that if the knife was to slip it's only going to go as far as my as my finger, it's only going to drop as far as my finger and I'm holding it quite firmly between my knees as well. And the way to, to do this is just to push the knife in a little bit and then twist it a little bit so you're opening up a split. I'm not trying to knock it right the way in, I'm not going to have the power to do that but if you just twist the knife a little bit and there you see my finger stops it from going any further. Uh, my thumb is nice and out the way as well. So that's a nice control way of starting to split. Now you can use the um, the knife a little bit like a, a fro. Now I can see that the split is just ever so slightly going off to this side. I think it's partly because of the twist as well. It's probably spiralling around a little bit. So I am trying to bend it a little bit more back into the middle. So trying to so if the split goes off to the, the right hand side as I look then we want to bend the left hand side a bit more and just pull it back in and that's the, uh, the secret of cleaving. I'm, I'm really, I'm not slicing down either as well, I'm, I'm actually just using the knife as a lever now it's, you see it's just going off a little bit more to one side so I'm going to try and bend it back into the middle, there we go. Keep my other hand well out of the way. 
in case the knife was to slip. But it's not. I'm not really pushing downwards with the knife. I'm just using it to prise, prise this open. And then as we get further down towards the bottom, you take your hand away. And there we go. And this will demonstrate just how much twist and spiral there was in there. So if you can see the the length, it does actually spiral round quite a lot. So we could make two ribs. We could make one rib and, and the second rib from that, especially if we were doing a bigger basket, because we want the ribs a little bit wider. But here, we're we're making a fairly small basket, and we need to be able to deal with this this spiral as well. So I'm going to split this in half again, each of those in half. So we should get four smallish ribs from this. So same technique again, just pushing down with my hand on the top. You could, if you prefer, um, hold the, the rib down on the ground and use a, a little hammer or a, a mallet, sorry, on the, on the top there. Um, that would also just, just set it in as well. We only just want to set the blade in and start the split. There we go. So if you were making thatching spars, for example, this is a, instead of using a, a spar hook or a little, little bill hook, you do exactly the same, same process. A thatching spar is a little um, little staple that's used for holding down um, traditional thatch on a on a roof. Usually made of hazel, they are. So again, I'm just using the knife just to prise it apart, not pushing down, not trying to cut it, but the knife is just being used just to just to spy, um, separate two halves like so. And we've got two fairly reasonable ribs. There's a little bit of twist on there, um, that's all right. Now, what we're aiming for with our ribs is, I think I said earlier on, is something which is a little bit like a very flattened diamond. Can you imagine that? So you start off with a, with a diamond shape and you're gonna take off the corners, um, the top two corners to leave you with, um, well, it's actually a flattened hexagon, I suppose. Um, I call it a lozenge, lozenge shape. So the outer part of the rib is the um, is the outermost part of our uh, what was our rod. So that's got a bit of um, you know it's got a bit of a curved edge. We'll we'll keep that. But what we'll do is we'll take out the um, this angled part underneath towards the middle. So again, the technique I tend to use is knife um, held firmly against my knee, so the knife isn't moving, but the but the piece of wood is. It's nice and safe, it's controlled. You can go as fast or as slow as you want. Um, if you want to take off a little bit more, then push down with the knife. Don't try and, um, don't try and um, cut in, but actually just put a little bit more downward pressure on the knife, or you could you know, take off a very fine, fine shaving. And you can see I'm just taking out that sort of central peak um, from what was a uh, triangular shape now we're, we're going towards a flattened lozenge now if there is a little bit of spiral so I'll just hold it like so and I can, maybe maybe that way and I can see that it is as I look it's actually twisting around so this is my sort of the middle of it is my sort of datum I'm using that as the um, as a guide and then I'm looking down and I can see it's twisting around now if I take off too much on one side I won't be able to counter that twist I'll end up with something which is actually a little bit already lopsided so if I was to just draw the knife oh sorry draw and just follow that center center line you can see that that's it that's where the pith is so if I was to just try and follow that around I'd actually be just following that spiral around and I'd end up with a, a, a rib that in itself had a had that spiral um, in it now I want to try and avoid that so I'm just going to I'm just going to focus on taking off a little bit more from that side and maybe just a little bit of flattening there. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to counter the, the, uh, the twist by just taking off a little bit more on one side. Um, you can see I, I want an even, um, an even width of, of rib as well so some places it's just a little bit thick so there you can see it's just broadening out a little bit, so we'll just trim off a little bit off the side. Not too much. Not too much. 
a bit more off that side. And again, this is a lot of this is about sort of feel. So, if I want to see if I've taken enough off or taken up, taken off too much, then what I'll do is just put the knife down for a moment. Is just bend it. So, work, I work my way along, and I can just feel. I'm not really. I can't really see so much, but I can sort of feel where it's there's a little bit of resist, more resistance to bending, and where it's perhaps bending enough and I don't need to take it off anymore so here it's quite flexible I can shape it quite easily just using my thumbs as well so I'm, I'm kind of using my thumbs to apply bending um, oh there's a pivot and my, my fingers to, to apply a sort of bending moment on there work my way along so there it feels that just a little bit thick um, and yeah I can see I can sort of see there's also a knot there which is giving a little bit of resistance as well so what I'll do is I'll trim off a bit more off the inside and I'm always trimming off the inside and not the outside that's quite important it's just still a little bit thicker as well along there so again anywhere where there was a knot forming in the in the rod the the, the tree has responded to that just by building up a little bit more material around it you know the fibers have tried to work around it as it's grown and it's just thickened it a little bit more there and that's why it's, it's just there's just a little bit more resistance so the other thing I'm, I'm sort of fairly happy with that now don't want to take off too much but the other thing I'll, I'll perhaps look out for or try and try and do actually is um, we've ended up with quite a sharp edge there and when you come to start weaving you don't really want those sharp edges there because there'll be a tendency for it to um, slice into the weaver you're going to be sliding the weavers in between these ribs and there's always a possibility that the the weaver could actually um, get cut um, just by that very sharp edge so I'll just run the um, run the knife along that edge and just round it off ever so slightly not not taking off a, a lot but just enough to to round it off okay and same all the way along a bit bit more taken off there that's all right just very slightly just rounding it off can you see there's just a little little whisker of of wood being uh, cut off there okay and the same on the other side it's just a bit thick there uh, so I'm just looking along maybe it's just a little bit wide at that end that's all right okay so that's our first rib now it's quite handy as well at this stage just to begin to to decide on the shape that you want so I'm just gonna apply a little bit of bending pressure just to, towards one end I'm not I'm not exactly sure what what shape I've got until I'm um, until I've assembled the basket but I'm just kind of just begin to see what what it could do what kind of shape it would it could potentially make Let's get rid of that little whisker there we go so that's a rib now the basket I'm making I think will probably have something like nine or possibly eleven ribs it's usual for you to have an odd number of ribs okay um, and I'll just show you why that is um, so this one has one two three four five six seven eight nine quite quite thin ribs so that's our center one there and that acts like a keel so it means that um, you've got symmetry haven't you? you've got left right symmetry which is quite nice I think that's that's a little bit more attractive as well um, and it just gives you a sort of you know a, a central um, sort of little bit of uh, stiffness to the basket if we didn't have that one there and we, we had an even number so imagine taking that center one out you'd have you'd have a kind of a gap there wouldn't you in between your, your weavers I know you'd, you'd space the ribs a little bit close together but even so you'd have a little bit of a what I think is a, a little bit of a weak spot at the bottom of the barrel which is really what um, what you want to try and avoid you want to you know I think that's that's a much more sort of satisfactory finish and, and strength to the basket to have an odd number of of ribs and it, it gives you a, a sort of left right up and down symmetry as well okay so that's the first of our ribs so we've um, we took one out I've, I've lost my other half 
it'll come back. So we can do um, we can do another one, same principle. I'll I'll, um, I'll show you again. So we're going to split this in half, meaning we get four ribs out of each section of the rod. So finger on the top, push just pushing the knife down, just kind of twist a little bit just to prise it open. The knife set. And just working our way, our way down. I don't want to push the knife down. Barely, hardly ever pushing the knife down. Really, it's just when it, when I know that the split has formed, I can just slide it down a little bit. But if I try and push now, there's every chance that the knife will just, um, the, well, the split will just run off, and the knife will follow it, and then we're putting our, our hands in, in in a dangerous uh, area so just using the knife just to separate the two halves just prise them apart and when there's a, a bit of a gap then push the knife down a little bit and again this is sort of about feel really isn't it you I can sometimes I can feel when there's more resistance on one side and I need to bring the, the split over onto that side just to even it out so we're near the near the end now and it'll just you see it's just running off a little bit towards the end but that's not a problem so we've got two nice ribs again there's that, that spiral which we'll have to have to address as we um, as we as we dress the rib so using the middle as my sort of datum that's going to be my my level I'm just going to take off a bit more on one side on the yeah on the higher side, I suppose, as, as you look at it. And I don't know if you can see uh, Z, but the, if you look at it end on, can you see it's, it's a, what I call a lozenge shape. So it's like a flattened hexagon, isn't it? Um, two flat surfaces and two angled. Um, and then we'll, we'll trim off those edges just to take out the sharpness as well. Okay. And the same again, turn it round. There's a little bit of a, a scar there. I wonder if that was where we um, where we had that um, scar on the bark earlier on. You see it's just left a little bit of dark wood there. So again, so just trim off the sides a little bit and turn it around do the other side again and ideally you want eight uh, sorry um, nine or eleven or however many ident near identical ribs the weavers they might be different widths um, just depends how you've how much you've managed to harvest and how how it has come off the the, the rod but the actual um, the ribs ideally should be almost identical if possible so I'll just uh, just check this for, for bend bendiness So I can feel there's there's quite a lot of resistance there. In fact, this is still quite a little bit too thick. So we do need to take off a bit more, a bit more meat off this one. So I'm just working on the inside, if you like, uh, leaving the outside as it is, but just just focusing on the inside. Turn it around so we try and keep keep a bit of symmetry again. And if it does become a little bit flat, then um, I'll just angle the blade, or sorry, angle the wood, keep the blade fixed and just angle the wood and it just creates a bit of an, um, an angled cut that we can f use to form our sort of lozenge shape. It's just a bit thick there still. Yeah, I think there's a, there must have been a knot or, or that 
scar in the uh, in the woods. Something's happened just at this point. You can learn actually quite a lot about a tree, how it's grown, just from from working it, seeing how the how the grain runs, where the knots are. Just imagining what the tree was doing when it when it when it grew like that. Why is it spiralled round? What's it, where's the light been coming from? Has it been in competition? Has other things grown faster? There we go. We'll just trim off the edges again. Tiny little whisker of wood. Same again on the other side. And if it does go a bit thin at one end, a bit narrow at one end, that's okay because when we actually put the, the, the ribs into the basket, we will be trimming those ends as well. We'll be, we'll be tapering those down, so it's not the end of the world if the ends uh, do go a little bit thinner than the rest of the, the rib. Just a bit more off here. That's lovely. I keep dropping my knife cover. There we go. So it's still a bit, a bit thick there, but I think we'll... Uh, I think we'll, be, we'll coat that. In fact, you, yeah, may, maybe not actually, because as I'm as I'm holding it between my two hands and pushing it together, you can see where it is actually flexing more. It's flexing, bending more at that end and less so at this end. So it might. It's just another indication as to where there's perhaps it's the rib itself is still a little bit thick, and perhaps we do need to take off some more. I don't want to go take too much off, but it's a good in indication at this stage whether or not the rib is going to form the right shape for your basket. There we go. So there's a bit of a bump on the back, so I might just trim off a little bit there, but not not too much. As I say, I don't generally uh, shave down the the outer side, if you like, of the rib. It's usually the inside which allows you to form the, the right shape. Brilliant. That'll do. That's better. Just bend it a little bit to shape. Okay, we've moved inside now, uh, thanks to the great British weather, which has uh, given us a, a fine spring uh, downpour, um, much easier to work inside um, when it's raining. Um, we might find that the, uh, we might get interrupted by, the, by our cat at some point during the day, so uh, hopefully that shouldn't, uh, shouldn't disturb us too much. Okay, I'm going to continue on from where we, we left off. Um, so here's, the, um, here's the, the rod that we were working yesterday. Um, taking all the weavers off. Uh, this is the top end, so it's a slightly thinner end. You remember we made the ribs out of the, uh, the thicker um, uh, foot of, the, of, of this rod. Um, this one hasn't been cleaned up, so I'm gonna, um, using my knife as usual, um, just gonna take off all of these ridges uh, and high points um, and just make it nice and cylindrical, make it, make it much, uh, much easier to, to bend and also give it a, a, a nicer finish as well. Okay, so I think We'll probably have to cut this short as well uh, using our secateurs, so cut it to length slightly. Okay. The same technique as before, holding the knife still and slightly, slightly angled so it's a sort of slicing, slicing cut and taking out all of those high points and, uh, and ridges and unevenness. See some of these little, um, little pegs here which is from when we lifted the weaver off uh, yesterday and we can cut those flush now yeah, maybe maybe another, another one there as well okay just need a little, little knot there 
and I'm not going to trim the whole whole length. Um, you 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 know if you want to make the maximum use of the of the rod. Um, there's another little knot there. If you want to make the maximum use of the the rod, then I might take perhaps two or three um, pieces for the rims out of this, so we get three half half hoops. Obviously, just only need two for a basket, um, so the other one I can I can bend and then store ready for use on my next basket. So just tidy that up a little bit. Get rid of all those little whiskers, and just. A bit here as well. Now, ideally, you'd, you'd want some a length, a section of this rod which is fairly consistent in diameter. So, if it got too thick at one end, too thin at the other, it would affect the um, the actual uh, shape and flexibility of of the the rim when we bend it. So, ideally, the same have a section that's the same, roughly the same diameter all the way along its length. Okay. I think we're we're ready to take that. So I'll cut this um, shorter with our secateurs. Um, if it's much thicker than this, then a pair of loppers is is probably preferable. But my my secateurs are nice and sharp, and they're quite strong as well. Um, and obviously, you know, cut the length you think you need for the bat size of basket you're making. Um, so we're making a fairly small basket. It doesn't matter if it's slightly too long. We can always cut it shorter later on uh, but obviously better to have it approximately the right oh, sorry better to have it slightly too long and trim it than have it really really too short okay um i can see oh, there's a little bit of it's a little, a little bit of uneven uneven this end Okay, so that's that's quite nice. Just a knot there. Okay. Now we're ready to bend it. Um, there isn't a, necessarily a, an optimal way to bend it. I think you, you can sometimes see that there's a sort of natural um, sort of flexibility. There'll be some parts of it which are, are more rigid and, and uh, less flexible, um, and they're generally quite good. Um, for the arms, um, or for the longer part, the, the curved part, you want a, a section which is a little bit more, feels a little bit more flexible. And as it happens on this one, it is, you know, I've chosen it to be right in the middle, um, um, right in the middle of the length. And that's obviously where the, the maximum amount of bending is gonna be in the curvature. Okay, so we'll bend it over our knee, but I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna create something which is roughly sort of, um, half a circle so I'm imagining a, a curvature which is circular obviously we're only going to require half the circle so you can start bending but rather than um, as we were doing with our weavers we were you know using a lot of leverage to to take the, the weavers off this time we're going to focus the um, the bending in, in just a, a smaller smaller area so you can see my thumbs are much closer together I'm not holding it way out here um, it takes quite a lot of effort, um, and as it happens, my knee, or well, the shape of my knee, is just about the right kind of curvature. So you can see this is starting to go. If you find that, that there are sections which do feel as though they're more rigid, they're not wanting to bend, what you can do, um, primarily when the, the bark is, is off, is you can actually thin it down a little bit on the inside. So I'll, I'll do that as well. So here it just feels a little bit more rigid. It might be because there's that knot there, so there's a little bit more material. And I'm just gonna just gonna thin it out a little bit, just on the inside, and always thin out on the inside rather than the outside of the curve. The reason being that if you if you imagine as you're bending this this rod, so the inside is being compressed and the outside is under tension. So if you slice away on the outside, then you're cutting through the fibres, which themselves are going to be under tension and the, and then it's more likely to split and, and and tear off little bits as you're um as you're bending it you want to keep the the, the, the grain and the fibers as continuous as possible um on the on the tension side so it's it's better much better to thin it out on the on the inside of the curve so we'll keep going again so 
So again here it just feels a little bit a little bit rigid so a bit, a bit more resistance to, to it being bent. Okay so just take this. not taking out a lot but just a little bit on the inside. Okay. And this is going reasonably well, touch wood. And occasionally you'll just hear a little little snap. I don't know if you picked that up on the on the microphone there, but there's just a little snap which suggests that some of the some of the grain, some of the fibres on the outside have just begun to to separate out and, and maybe snap. So I'm just mm -hmm. keeping an eye on that just to make sure it's not it's not actually gonna begin to snap completely at that point. Just had another little one there, so it may well go. Now you can use a mould for this. Oh, there we go. So there's a just the fibres beginning to separate somewhere along there. So I'm just being a bit more careful. You can use a mould for doing this um, rather than your knee, and that's also perfectly perfectly fine. Gives you the same same results, and and you do actually get a little bit more control when you have a mould or a, a a former to bend it around. That's what the uh, chair makers use, don't they? That's right, yeah, yeah. Um, and it, it and it can be a big help, and it, obviously it's a little bit easier to to do as well. You're not using your knee, and they um, you can by fixing one end of the of the rod in in the mould and then bending it around the other one. You've got quite a lot of power and leverage to pull it around the sh the shape of the mould. Um, and the other thing you can do also is is to steam them first. So um, put them in a, in a either a homemade or a purpose made steamer. Um, and they always reckon about, an, I think it's about an hour for every inch of wood. So something like this, maybe I'd, I'd put in for, for in the steamer for about half an hour, perhaps, or, or you know, maybe three quarters of an hour. And with a steamer, how how would you make your steamer if you were to make one? Okay, well, I made one out of a, a wallpaper um, stripper and um, and a, a length of drain pipe um, and some actually some plant pots at each end, some fairly rigid plant pots at each end to, to, act, as, um, to act as stops and stop and prevent the steam from escaping. Um, it was fairly, fairly easy to do. Um, it's, I think it's quite, it's quite safe as well because the, uh, the, the actual wallpaper steamer is, is, although it's electrically powered and you'd obviously need a, a power point to, to a power socket to attach it to, it, it does have various safety features that stops it from overheating. Um, and it's got a controlled amount of steam that it's producing as well. Okay, so I'm actually going to put this between my legs now just to help me to bend it in. I'm, I'm applying, bring, just bringing my knees together really, just to, I'm applying a bit of pressure with my fingers and my thumbs. So it just went, just began to go there. Yeah, so if, if you were going to steam this, then you know obviously you would use a you would have to use a former, uh, and um, you've got to have you know be very careful about about using it and the you know using handling hot wood. It will actually reach quite a high temperature. This is going reasonably well. It will reach quite a high temperature. You you do need to use gauntlets and welders gloves or something like that just to help protect your hands while you're handling it. Um, now the steaming itself, it's not so much the steam, it's, it's more the temperature helps to soften the fibres and the, and the wood and the, particularly the, the layers in between, in between the, um, the fibres just helps to, to soften that and, um, and it allows you to, to bend it into well, almost any shape as, as you say with the chair making you can get some amazingly amazing curvatures. So I can, I'm just mindful that it is, it has snapped, particularly around that that knot. So maybe where we, just where we cut it with our knife earlier on, it's, it's gone. So, in these circumstances, what I tend to do is is release the the pressure, and number one, you can just just peel back some of this. If you do this while you're you're bending it, if you peel these back while you're bending it, then what will tend to happen is they'll you'll take out quite a big big chunk of the the wood because it's still under tension, so it could it could split even more. Just a little bit there. Um, yeah, and then just mindful of that, I'm going to uh, 
I'm going to actually just take off a little bit more off the inside because it does feel as though there's a little bit more resistance round about there. So this will help it bend over and bend right round without take without splitting any more. Hopefully, always taking using my knife on the inside. We might find it does actually we lose a little bit more on the outside as well, but we'll see how it goes. Obviously, the thicker the the, the rod, the the more effort it takes to do this and you might find your knee is just not strong enough and your arms just aren't strong enough to achieve the required curvature and again just just focusing the, the bending in certain areas just to get it to, to come right round Now here it just feels a little bit thinner, so I'm not going to try and apl avoid applying any pressure just there, but maybe just around that point. Okay, and we're nearly there actually, so at this point what I tend to do is to get some cord or some string, which was here. Any kind of string will do. I'm just preparing for when it's actually the right shape and the right amount of curvature so I'm not having to, to sort of fumble around from my piece of string then so I'm just getting this ready ready to tie onto this end and there it's just gone a little bit on that knot but I think we'll probably live with that for now maybe no actually no we'll, we'll just take off a little bit more off the inside there just stop it from going any further so it's a sort of iterative process you, you bend it see if it's it's just starting to break hopefully it won't but it's good to just do this a few times just to make sure you're getting the right and, and you know if you find that you, it's squared off a little bit too much and you're forming a corner then you can also just just run your knife along the corner as well and just round it off again I'll do that there as well so we're keeping something which is roughly circular and doesn't have any sharp edges there we go let's finish off now so hopefully this is this is becoming more and more plastic as well as we're as we're bending it that that whole action is actually making it much easier to bend it it doesn't want to spring back quite so much okay so i'll wrap this around here just help use it to help and it's just gone again It just seems to be around that, that point, I think. Let's do it a little bit more. I don't want to go too quickly with this. find you've just got these little whiskers towards the end which are just starting to, to turn off to, to pull off so. so essentially you're trying to go for half an oval basically yeah yeah that's right you can make a circular basket exactly the same oh it's gone a little bit too much I might just trim that off later on when it has set to shape and just using my cord just to pull it towards the end so yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's half a an oval or an ellipsoid. I suppose it's the uh, uh, an ellipse. Sorry, um, is the is the shape, and it's slight. It's slightly uneven. It's just slightly out of out of symmetry. Um, so I might just bend it a little bit more. Once once I've tied this string around, I can I can actually reshape it a little bit as well. And we'll deal with those little whiskers that are split off when it's when the shape is set. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to take that 
too far. Okay, so that's pretty much the shape we're, we're aiming for. It's not quite perfect. We'll, we'll deal with that when it's set. Um, I don't want to take off too much while it's still got a lot of spring in it. Um, and the thing to do now is to actually set it, uh, allow it to dry. So by keeping it in a sort of dry place, perhaps an airing cupboard or above a radiator for a day, a couple of days, something like that, it will actually set to that shape. So when we take it out, it will no longer have any spring. And in fact, you'll know that because we have some prepared earlier. So this was exactly done exactly the same way. A little bit, a little bit thinner as it happens. Um, and when you can, when you can feel when it's in, it, when it's um, it's in the air and covered or, or, or drying out, and you've got the string around it, you can feel when it wants to still wants to spring out. There's still that elasticity in there, but eventually you'll you'll find that the, the string itself just slackens because it it doesn't um, it doesn't want to spring back and it's and it's set to shape. So that is one we we did before. Um, that also lost a few few little fibers on the on the outside as well, but we've tidied those up. Okay, so I'll put that one in the air and cover to dry out. Maybe a couple of days for that. But I'll show you also uh, ones where we haven't taken the bark off at all. So we've got two here, which I did probably about two days ago. Approximately the same diameter as the one we've been working on. Um, now these, when, when you come to bend them, are actually much more difficult to, to bend because they haven't been worked. They haven't been... Um, we, we haven't been adding the sort of plasticity to the, to the hazel which you get when you actually take the, the, the weavers off working them backwards and forwards you know bending them repeatedly actually makes it much easier to, to bend but what I do find is you get a much more even curvature um, and there's far less it's far less likely to actually snap okay, very occasionally it will it will do but I'm quite I'm quite happy with the way these have gone these these are we're bent in the round now the thing to remember about these is that you can't necessarily I, mean, you, you, I suppose you could do but you can't shave off anything on the inside it will you know you, if you do a little bit in one area you'll have to do the whole lot just to make it aesthetically uh, pleasing in the final product but oh, there we go so so these are these are about two two days in the airing cupboard and I think they probably need about a week to two weeks possibly because these were, were cut green um, just a, a few days ago actually just the day before I, I bent them to shape so still lots of moisture in there um, these are ones I did some time ago so these are the ones we're going to use for our, our basket now now this one actually did where are we this one here it's, it's got a little bit of still got a little bit of spring in it so maybe I took this out of the air and covered a little bit too early and and it's just begun to reform its shape. So we'll have to factor that in actually when we do um, assemble the, the rim. But I think we're ready to actually now assemble these into a, into a basket shape. So we'll go through that next. Okay, we've got our two uh, rims that I prepared some time ago. These are, as I say, have been set. They, they were uh, put on the, over the radiator um, just to dry out. Um, and this one, you see, has got a little, still got a little bit of spring in it. So we probably took it out a little bit too soon. It's just wanting to reform, but it's not so much that it really wants to straighten out. The first job I want to do is just to trim off these little side branches. There we go. So it's nice and flush. And we want to measure up and mark up exactly where we want to trim these these to length. Now these are a little bit too long. Um, I think that's probably approximately the, the size that I want. Now, what I need to do is to, is to mark and trim these to length. So you can see it's just extending a little bit too long that side as well. So I'll use a, a marker pen. Just measure those up again. So let's try it maybe. So it's going to go to approximately there. OK, 
okay and also mark the other side as well because this is we can actually splice these two together and splicing is where you put a, a chamfer you shave a chamfer on each each of these um, half rims and then they fit together the two chamfer faces fit together and uh, and it and it fits flushly so same again here and there um, a mark you can use a, a pencil or, or let's just make that clear on that just gone slightly too far so I'll just mark that again a question while you're doing this yeah this is partly my ignorance but you're using two pieces okay yeah and folding them together what's stopping you from using one absolutely nothing um, and lots of baskets um, hazel baskets I've seen at the National Museum of Wales um, actually are made just with one piece of uh, hazel for the for the rim there's no reason why you can't um, I think possibly the reason is because it's much if you were making these as a, as a farm a small holder back in uh, you know back in the day in mid Wales you may not necessarily have a mold to bend the uh, the hoop around it if you're using one piece of hazel a bit like the the swill baskets if you ever, ever um, look up the, the detail about how to make a swill basket an oak swill basket the the rim is made in in one piece um, but it's it's steamed and bent around a a mold now if you if your only piece of equipment is a is a knife and maybe a, a bill hook then you're not going to have the means to be able to to do that um, so it's, it's far easier in a, with a, a, a fewer number of tools and equipment to actually make them in two halves because as you saw earlier on I could actually bend that around my my leg and it, it would you know we can we can adapt two halves to be the right and um, the right shape for each other whereas one a one-piece hoop would would require something to form it around um, and I think you'd, you'd probably find that much more difficult if you if you didn't have the means to do it so I can see where our, our marks are what I'll do now is just trim these to length so use, using secateurs just trim these to length Oops. sorry about that Zed it's taking out the camera man yeah. <laughs> Let's just double check. I've got this. Um, it also helps actually to. And probably should have done, but I'll, I'll, I can remember remember which way the the hoop's actually going to go. So I might just mark it again, so I can marry up. Uh, there we go. So I know that where it's got two marks those marry up and where it's got one mark those will marry up it's a bit like the uh, the builders and the carpenters uh, used to do when they were building and making uh, t the timber frames and uh, stonework etc yeah so I'll just trim that to the right length as well And they should be roughly symmetrical. They're, they're, they're slightly out, but that's that's okay. I mean, ideally, you'd want them. Actually, I will. No, I will. Um, I will trim them a little bit. This one a little bit short, and let's just double check that. It's that way around. If that's. I'm just sensing that this this one is a little bit. This piece is a little bit longer than. That piece. Uh, can you see that? Let's marry those up. See the the, the sort of long straight legs are just a little bit slightly out from each other. So I might actually just trim that that one a little bit more. It makes for a, a more symmetrical uh, rim to the basket. Okay. So now we need to splice them and I'm going to start, I'm going to have them um, overlapping um, vertically like so, so oh, actually no horizontally sorry, the, 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 uh, the, the splice face, faces will be vertical but it will actually marry up something, something like that. 
side by side. This one would actually go on the outside. The cat's just entered the room. Hello. Do you want to make a basket? No. So it'll work. It'll fit together a bit like like that. But obviously these these two faces will be spliced together, so they'll be nice and flush to each other. Okay. So we've got to remember which way we're going to splice. So one, one will have to be sliced on the inside and one will have to be sliced on the, the outer face. Let's try and find the mark again. So it's from about that point onwards. So the way to do this again is the same technique as we've been doing before. Holding the knife steady and drawing the, the piece of wood across. And I start my, my cut high up but as it, as it gets thinner and thinner, obviously you don't want to cut any more towards the top. So I'm just, I'm cutting less and less each time, less and less along the length of the, the splice. And you want to fine this, you want to taper this down to a, to a fine, a fine point or a flat, sorry. Um, it's not really going to be pointed. It's just going to be thinned down. You can actually see the, um, the, the center of the, of this, of this stem there. The pith, as they, as they call it. Just taking up a little bit more. Cats do like chasing small bits of water. So there we go. So we've, you see, we've thinned that down. Maybe I'll just take up off that a little bit more, just right at the very tip. So it's quite fine. Um, it's also got a little bit of flex in it, which is helpful. And you can check it visually just to make sure that the taper is even there's no bits where it's it's too thick and that's reasonably good okay so i need to, to now marry this up to the other side uh, so that was two two marks so now what, what i'll do is i'll splice it on the outside the outside face of this so we've got an inside uh splice and the outside and they will fit together they will marry up together and um, and it will be reasonably flush you should also aim to have um, thick um, so if, you, if you've got a slightly thicker end which is wouldn't be unusual this will be slightly larger diameter than this end because it obviously the, the stem would have tapered then it's quite good to marry up um, the, the thinner end of one ho half hoop with the thicker end of the other half hoop and that way you don't end up with a, a rim which has you know too much uh too much on on one side and too little on the other so it just it just evens itself out so that was that was a thin so i need to go to the thick side of there and remember it's the outside outside spice you can also oh, just just give it a little twist and a, and a wiggle just to just to straighten it up that probably I just thought I might have, uh, might have damaged it then, but it's all right. Okay, so what did we say outside of this one? So it's the same technique, and it's a little bit more awkward when you're doing the outside. Let's start up right up at the mark. We've got a little knot there, so that's going to resist. And another, another knot there, and every, whenever you get a knot in the wood, it's where the, the fibres are going to work around try and grow around that little knot or stem um, or leaf node or whatever it is and the um, it resists being being cut so I keep checking the, the width keep checking that it's actually it is nice and flat Halfway, you can see the, the pith layer. Just take a little bit more off the end. Okay, it's just a bit more in the middle. Right, so let's see how those two marry up. So that's 
not too bad actually. Maybe just a little bit. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, I might actually just trim off, just round that off. There's a little bit of a, a sharp edge. I don't know if you can see, it's just slightly. Yeah, this, this, this was the thicker, the thicker piece. Um, of thicker end and it's just like ever so slightly too big so I'm just going to round off that corner that edge and it'll just help it to sit flush then any um, sharp edges either on the rim or the or the ribs um, potentially could slice through your weavers when we actually come to do the the final assembly so it's good just to round off any any little sharp edges like that. Okay, let's see how that looks again. That's not too bad. Maybe I'll just take a little bit more off here just to, so they do actually sit flush against each other. As I'm looking at this, I can see there's a little bit of a, a bulge. It's not a, a can, you know, an even taper. Just that section is, it's not just slightly too much uh, wood there. So maybe just I'll take a little bit there. together okay that's better and ideally you want the, the the tip of one end to meet the mark that we originally put on there so I'm, I'm probably going to just take off a little bit more at the top there so that the the mark does actually marks do line up this one's okay yeah, I'll just take off a little bit more of the, the very top there and they should fit nice and evenly. And here I'm, I'm using the I'm using my thumbs on the back of the the knife blade to help get a really nice controlled cut. Can you see that? That's you know it gives you a nice bit of control. So I'm not having to do big movements with the knife or the or the piece of wood. Just gives me means I can focus on on the little bit of of the uh, the the rim hoop that wants to actually cut. So that's okay. Now we'll do the same on the other side. Okay, we'll do the other side now. So just double checking which bit which parts I'm going to actually splice. So here we've got. Um, the lower half of the hoop on the inside and the upper half of the hoop on the outside um, and on the opposite side of the of the hoop we'll do the the, the opposite really so we'll um, splice the outer face of this top hoop and the inner face of this smaller hoop and uh, so it's not quite um, it's not quite sym symmetrical I suppose it's a mirror image of each other it's more a um, you know, it's, it's more of a sort of sideways kind of shift, if that makes sense. So yeah, so we'll just do the outside of the top hoop. Let's double check that again. So yeah. Going right from the, the mark, you can see my marks at the top there. To start with, cut, slice down the whole length and then move the knife a bit further down and just focus on the, towards the, the tip or the very end.
And it's quite good if it's if it has got a little bit of flex in it. See, I think I might take off a bit more, but I can always just just feel as though if there's any flex, and it does help it to bring the two splices, two splice face together if they've got a little bit of flexibility in them. So I'll just thin that down a bit more. Yeah, I can feel that's that can just bend a little bit more, which is a bit better. Check them side on. So maybe just still a little bit thick towards the top, so just slice off. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Okay, and you can actually see. Can you can you see the two? two faces so it's a, a, just a quick way of checking that you are actually um, slicing down the right face this should be um, you should be able to see both of them this is obviously if we'd gone on the inside then we you know we'd look here and uh, we'd only be able to see sorry this way around we'd only be able to see that that face but yeah okay so I'll just double check that they do Mario, I'll put my knife down while I do that. Uh, it's that way around. So that's so. So that's still okay. Now, just to double check, I'm going to um, splice down the inside face of this hoop. Again, there's a little knot here. So I'm just going to just cut that flush to start with and work into the mark which I, I can't see now there we go it's up there this knot's going to get in the way a little bit so it's going to be a little bit difficult to work around so I'm just going to use that thumb push on the back of the knife just to cut through it In the perfect world, of course, there'd be no knots or irregularities in our wood, and we'd be we'd be done in a few hours, wouldn't we? <laughs> there we go, going through the pith layer now. And yeah, it's just just round that knot where it's it's more difficult to slice through. That's still a little bit thick. Good. So now, hopefully, we should be able to bring these two together and actually attach them. So See, now I'm, I'm, I'm actually checking this side, this this side here. Um, I think there's probably probably needs to just take a little bit more off. Off the very top, and the other thing I've noticed is a, there's a little little knot on the outside, a little um, peg there. So I'll just use my secateur just to trim that off because that will interfere with the weaving as well. Um, and perhaps just just shave off a little bit more with a knife, the very top there. Okay, I think we're good to, to go and nail these two together. Okay, um, you'll see I've put some tape around the two hoops to help to hold them together, uh, top and bottom. And what I'm going to do is, um, before we nail, uh, put little nails through to, to permanently hold them, um, I'm going to pre-drill, um, just using a, a hand drill and a really fine little uh, drill bit there and it just helps to 
avoid any chance of the, the hazel splitting, which it can, it can do when you start knocking nails into it. So it's, it's a little bit fiddly this. We'll do this four times, one for each hole. I think I might actually knock the, um, the nails to hold it all together. So what particular nails are you using? Um, well, ideally you want something which has got a little bit of flesh in it. You see, what we're going to do is, once we've knocked the nails through, we're actually going to... So with the rim complete, what's next in the process? Okay, we've got all the, the components now for our basket. We've got our rim, we've got our nine ribs that we prepared earlier, and also we've got all of all our weavers down there. Now I've been soaking those overnight um, in water. Uh, it's quite you can use them straight away. Um, they're still pliable. What I tend to do is is to dump them in a a, a bucket or a, a, a trug of, of water just to keep them um, supple and. Um, they're less likely to, to, to split if, if, if they're that little bit um, a little bit wet and and, uh, and haven't dried out. Okay, what we're going to be doing first is bending these uh, ribs to form the shape of the basket of the inside of the basket. Now I'll show you an example here of one that I've actually um, already started. I won't be working on this one, but it just shows you the principle. So we, we it's quite good to pre-form the ribs into them to form the, the out you know the, the shape of the inside of the basket um, I have actually done a few prior to now um, and I what well, it was more of an experiment than anything which was just to um, shape them and and then set them in the in the air and cupboard a little bit like we do with the the hoop on um, or the rim um, and just to see how feasible it is to pre-form them uh, you don't really need to do this because these are actually quite pliable anyway so it's e quite easy to um, to bend these to shape and once we start doing the weave um, they will actually maintain their shape um, we'll do a little bit of adjustments as we go along but once the weave starts to build up um, the actual ribs themselves do form they do set to the shape that we want so that usually I, I, I don't normally preform them but this was just a little bit of an experiment just to see how they would actually set and, th and these can be reshaped a little bit still but they are quite uh, quite dry now Instead, we'll use the ones we we prepared before. Now, the other thing to point out, I suppose, is the um, is how we actually do assemble the, the, the basket. Um, and you you'll see that we don't actually um, start at one end and work our way all the way along to the other end. What what you tend to do is is work at opposite ends at the same time or alternatively. So we'll we'll build up the weave on one end, um, add some ribs, and at the same time. Um, or we'll switch and um, straight over to the other end and do the same thing again so that it's it's actually going to build up almost evenly from from both sides one side then the other side and hopefully touch wood they will actually meet in the middle that's the the aim really um, and also the, what you'll find is when you do get to the middle hopefully it will be a, an almost sort of seamless join between the weavers from this side and the weavers from that side so you wouldn't actually know that how we we built it up it wouldn't 
it won't be apparent that we've, we've done it in two halves um, it will be uh, yeah it will be nicely nice nicely joined uh, weaving okay so the first thing to do is just to start to preform and um, bend these um, these ribs so I'll just put these down here and these are probably let's get one that's slightly longer so we start off the three ribs in the middle are actually the the longest ribs um, these remember we, we did actually oversize these so we're, we're going to be trimming these as well um, at the end but we want to put some a little bit of curvature in there because if we if we try and weave with the um, the the ribs not bent to shape a little bit then it's going to be really awkward they're always going to be wanting to straighten out so I do tend to just uh, just start to bend them a little bit and the, the way to do that again I mentioned before about just using your thumbs um, and fingers so rather than holding it both ends and trying to bend it just focus that pressure and that that bending force in one one place I should also say um what about the inside and outside the outs I tend to use the um when I when I'm bending the ribs I tend to imagine that the um, the outside of the bend is is, is the outside of the rod Do you, does that make sense so you your the bit that we shaved off on the inside um, earlier on is is actually going to be on the inside of our, our curve and there's no direct benefit to that but I think sometimes it, it can give a nice nice finish as well but also it, I think that you're kind of working with the with the um, the, the sort of the grain of, and the, the growth rings of the um, of the wood I think it would be more like to, if we bent it the other way around it would be more like to split and um, and tear off little little bits for the reason I explained earlier on about the rim so I'm just focusing the the pressure just in one or two places and I think I'm going to try and it's going to be a fairly shallow basket um, a little bit shallower than that a little bit deeper than that one so somewhere in between so I don't want a, a huge amount of curvature but I think I'm trying to keep it to have a uh, keep it to have a flattish underneath a flat bottom if you pardon the expression okay so I'm just focusing the, the bending just in in one place okay and because it's because it's been worked previously to take the rib to take the weavers off it is quite it's quite plastic it's it's wanting to um, re reform its original shape but it, it will actually set to the to the shape we bend it to so something like that okay and we'll just imagine whereabouts we're actually going to want to put some bending on here so it's going to be around about here can you see that that's a sort of approximately the shape we want so I'll, I'll just um, I'll just bend it again just around about there apply a bit of pressure and that will begin to to form the the shape of the, the actual inside of the basket so around about there I would say just keep that handy and I'm just working my way along just using my thumbs and fingers just to apply the pressure just very locally really it's amazing how much plasticity it has doesn't it it is and and you know the, the one of the joys of using hazel is the fact that it is so adaptable so it, it's very it's got lots of flex it can bend um, in you know more than probably any other um, any other shrub or, or, or tree species um, and of course it's got the benefits of short uh, coppice rotations as well short times that it takes to actually grow um, but it also can you know it can do this it can actually be bent to a particular shape and then set to that shape so it, it's almost got the best of best of all worlds I'll just do a little bit more there so we've got a sort of two two places where it's where it's curved and then a, a slightly flatter um, bottom which is, is quite a nice shape to aim for for our basket the, the whisket um, seems to be although I do take tend to make them a little bit deeper often many of the the whiskets I've seen in the Museum at, uh, Museum of Wales for example are actually quite surprisingly shallow and, and flat bottomed and I wonder if there's um, you know if there's a purpose for that a benefit of doing that maybe it's just a 
See that's curved, that's bent around quite nicely there, but I'm maybe I'll do just a little bit more there. You can always as well, it's worth mentioning, you've still got the opportunity just to, to trim these back um, with your knife. So, so for example, this side, it, it feels like it doesn't want to bend and, and, and hold its shape as, it, as it's doing there. Can you see that? It's sort of, so it's probably still a little bit thick there. This is, um, remember we made these kind of lozenge shape, didn't we? We, we gave them a, two, it's like a flattened hexagon. Um, but there's gonna be some parts where it's still a little bit thick. Um, so that would be a good, a good opportunity just to, if I can find my bit of cloth. Just between there we go. There we go. So good opportunity just to, just to trim it back again with our knife as we've been doing. Mostly, on, you know, on the inside. It's only a little bit. You can usually feel where it, when you're bending it, where it's it's resisting a bit more, and that's where perhaps you might want to trim it back so it will, just a bit more there as well. Yeah, I think that's, that's a lot better. Really local, localised bending pressure on that. I don't want it to break, but that's a little bit better. That feels a bit better. It's, it's a bit long at that end, but that's okay. We'll, we'll trim it. And don't forget, as we build up the basket, we can also adjust these as well so it's not the end of the world if it's not quite the right shape at this stage because we can always um, adjust it a little bit as, as the basket builds up maybe just a little bit more there so I keep keep putting it back in the in the hoop seeing how it how it forms yeah that, that's about right um, so I'll do the same for two more and we'll build up um, We'll put in three ribs to start with the middle two. We work from the from the uh, the middle to the outside, and as I say, working alternatively left and right, doing the same thing. Um, so I'll do two more. Now I'll put I'll do these the next two the same shape. So I'll use this as a kind of a a template for my next two ribs. Uh, I think that one was a short one, so I'll, I'll use use a slightly longer rib and. I'm just kind of visually seeing where where I've actually bent that over. So around about here. The fresher the um, the hazel is, as in you know if you if you if you do let them dry out, then they they do become more difficult to bend to shape. And uh, the more you know, the the fresher it is, the more pliable it is as well. Around about there again. So you can see I'm just applying, I'm using my thumbs, really sort of focusing. And this 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 process of bending it again is 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 making it more and more sort of pla plastic. It will want to hold the shape you bend it to. The more you work it, and the more you focus the the, the pressure into just a few areas okay so they're pretty good so just one more there we go so again just lining the two up with the one I want to bend to shape and it's probably going to be about there just make sure it's the right way around as well occasionally they will break um, see how it feels a little bit thicker occasionally they'll break but it's worth having a couple of, dare I say, spare ribs, <laughs> just to, uh, just in case one of them does snap. I'll just take out a little bit more there. And you can also trim to shape as well a little bit more if you find as you're working them in the as you're doing this, it's just they've just lost their shape, or you haven't, you've missed a little bit when you're trimming them previously. There we go. Let's try. It. So it's forming a sort of a radius, isn't it? It's just just in one or two parts of the the rib. Let's just do a quick comparison. So about there. And that way my 
my thumb is here. And straight away I can feel that that's actually you know just a little bit thick there. It's I've not quite trimmed it back there. So this is all about feel as much as anything. It's quite difficult to see visually that the one part of the, the rib is a bit a bit too thick, but as soon as you start to to bend it you can feel that, that there's resistance and it just needs thinning and trimming back a little bit. Okay, that's better. Let's double check again. So that's just begun to bend back up. About there. And about there on the thumb is. See there it's just begun to do you, you hear that little click? That little so and probably it's actually somewhere around that there was a knot there. I can see it's a lot thicker there, um, which I missed when I was trimming it. So that's where the, the the hazel builds up, you know, around that that little little knot. So you end up with more fibres or a bit bit thicker or slightly slightly twisted fibres and bent fibres as it works around that. So it's why it's bit, just a bit thick there. And then maybe I'll just I'll just trim that back as well. No, it'll stay. We'll leave that. We can always trim off that little whisker towards the end. It's not a problem. But again, this is shows the benefit of just keeping the 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 pressure just really locally, not trying to bend, hold it at each end and bend it, because that will cause it to, you know, your your, your splits to form and. But just applying the pressure really locally, you, you can f you can feel where it's too thick, where it's not bending, it's not just resisting. But also, you, you you get a bit more, much more control as well. Okay, so this one's a little bit more to just spring back to shape, but we'll we'll live with that. So that's okay. Okay, three ribs ready to put into the basket. Okay, we're uh, ready to actually start assembling our basket. Um, I've got our first three ribs that we bent uh, previously. They're, they're just ready to, to put in. And I'm, to start with, I'm just going to sort of remind myself where, what shape we're going to aim for. Um, these first three sit right on the, the, the center line here. And um, I want to position them really as central as I can. You can adjust them a little bit early on in the weave, but um, later on their, their, their positions are essentially set. Now before I, I do actually start weaving I think I'll just mention a, a few other little bits of um, equipment you can have handy which uh, for this stage. Um, a few um, clothes pegs like this. Um, in this, this process you're going to be really needing about five hands um, and a peg or a, a couple of clothes pegs to hold your weavers whilst you, you do something else are really handy. So that's, that's quite helpful to have. Um, a little bit later on we'll also use um, something like a bodkin which is a, a basket maker's tool for, for helping you to guide weavers um, into some tight places. Now this one is, um, yeah this one is, is a proper bodkin but I've previously just used um, the end of a, of a, a spoon like this and, and perhaps just filed it down, smoothed it off a little bit to, to form the, the sort of sharp shape and you're going to use that to help guide um, weavers um, in amongst the, the ribs when it when it gets a little bit tight. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is to put our our first weaver in. And your first weaver really needs to be reasonably long. Um, hopefully I can find the one I picked up before. There we go. Um, so you need a, a long first weaver and that will become apparent um, a bit later on. And ideally it needs to be reasonably thin in width and you could even sort of trim it down a little bit I haven't here but it does help to to start with thin weavers which are much easier to get into the sort of tight areas at this end of the the ends of the basket whereas when you get to the middle of the basket you find you you, you can use uh, broader weavers in fact I'll actually show you um, an example of one uh, of my basket here hopefully you can you can pick out the weavers at the very start it's quite tight 
to maneuver and work around there so thinner weavers do help and then they do actually broaden out as we get towards the middle and same at the at the opposite end as well okay so there's a couple of ways actually of starting off which I'll show you I'll show you um, the first way which is the way I, I did initially learn is we'll have a, a, a tail end of our of our first weaver so here's the tail end and you can you can have it wrapped around the the back of your your rim like so um, which is where your, your peg might come in handy so you can use a, a clothes peg or a, a clip or something like that just to help hold it in place so you, you've got hand hand free um, and I'll uh, in fact we might even do both perhaps we'll do we'll do both examples because it's a, a sort of test basket or an example basket we'll uh, we'll do use both um, both methods one at this end and one at the other end but to start with we'll have the tail end of the of, of the first weaver round the back and this is quite quite complicated to explain so it's sometimes it makes sense actually from from my direction but I'll try and explain it in a way that makes more sense as you're viewing it on the on the camera so you want your your first weaver to come round the front of the uh, the outside first outside rib okay and then it's going to come over the and round the rim and this is really fiddly when you when you've got not a lot of space to work in and lots of things to hold on to as well you want to try and get it as tight as possible so round the round the front of the first rib or the outside rib round the hoop and then round the front of the middle rib like so and things will fall fall out as, as I'm working but we can always put those put that rib back in in a second so can you see you've come around the front of the the first rib around the front of the middle rib and then round the front of the third rib if we can find it there we go so over the top of the hoop and then round the front okay so you've come, come cross 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 like so and you can always adjust the the position of those it's probably be easy to adjust these actually when you've got the uh, the other end tied in as well around the around the front there and then over the back of the the hoop like so and then back over the other way so you're actually forming a quite a, a nice little sort of cross cross shape over the, the actual ribs to help lock them in I'm sure there are other methods or ways of locking in your your first ribs like this um, similar methods but um, I haven't come across them yet but there we go so you've got um, a cross there and then round the back of the the, uh, the hoop and over the front of your middle rib and round the back of the hoop and if I can get the peg out of the way just briefly over the the other outside rib so can you see that you've got three three diagonal crosses okay there's our tail now hopefully your tail actually should be kind of held in place but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna keep it pegged for the time being just because it does does come loose a little bit once once the um, the weaving has started it you can you can take the peg off okay so we've can you see that again this is where you four pairs of hands would be really helpful so cross, across, and just kind of pull it tight as well. The tighter it is, the the, the better the, the finish as well. So I'm just using my, my fingers just to hold it in place. And because we're working indoors now, I can feel that all the weavers are actually starting to dry out very quickly. So warmth is actually the enemy of, of the basket maker because everything does dry out. And Okay, so, so we've got our final cross um, over our our final rib and then bring the weaver round the back again now you can actually start doing the weave okay so you've got three ribs locked in place like so and um, bringing it bringing the weaver over the back of the the rim or the hoop um, and this is um, this is a sort of as much a decorative thing as anything but um, I'll just hold that in place actually with a Let's do another peg and show you something. So 
So that's nice, nicely held in place just for now. Let me show you something on a, one of the other baskets down here. Um, the whisket that Charlie Jones made. Let's stay there. I'll put on the floor. Sorry, not that. Right, there we go. So, can you see? Um, we've actually got this sort of little twist here. Can you see it as the um, as the weavers have come round the back of the um, over the rim? You've actually got a sort of a twist, and it becomes much more apparent as the uh, as the weave broadens out. You've got that little twist, and the benefit of that is it keeps one side of the um, of the weaver on the outside. Um, so you can see it just as easily on this side as well. So you've got this this twist, and it makes sure that the outside, or perhaps even the bark side of the weaver, is always facing outwards. Because if, if you just wrapped it around, if we, if we brought our weaver over the top and then just, just carried on and then over the top, then you'd have alternating bark and, and sort of inside white surface. Um, I'll show you, perhaps it's more apparent on this one. Um, so we've got the, the white on the inside uh, and we want to keep the bark on the outside. So we put in this, this twist. Sorry, there's, so there's a twist there. It's more apparent actually on the outside. We put in this, so we actually twist the hazel round as we come over the um, over the top of the uh, of the rim each time. So we'll do that with our, our basket here. Even though to start with the you know there's no bark on this first weaver, I think we want to keep the style consistent. And this is characteristic of of the um, of the hazel basket really. I mean, if you're working with round wood, say willow, or you're just using um, cane or something like that or rush where it didn't matter you could just you could just carry on with the um just start weaving that backwards and forwards but what we want to do is put in a, a twist um and keep the sort of style consistent let's get rid of our peg just for a second now it might well split your hazel might well start to split um don't worry about that because it won't be obvious when you know early on in the um in the weaving it'll kind of get hidden by and large but also you've, you're not going to lose reduce the strength of the weaver by having a split like that because remember the the strength is is in the, is along the length the continuity of fibers is along the length so having a split there hasn't actually damaged the or reduced the continuity of fibers along it so we, we can actually get away with it occasionally splitting as it happens that little knot there that little hole there is it's helped us because that might actually stop the split from going any further. We'll see. So can you see I'm, I'm putting in a twist. And again, this is where about six pairs of hands is quite useful. You've got lots going on to start with. And then we're going to start our weave. So bring the weaver through. So there's our twist. So it goes underneath the first rib, over the middle rib. This is very fiddly. And underneath the third rib and pull it nice and tight if you can as well. Like so. Can you, can you see that under the first rib, over the middle one, under the first, under the, the, the outermost rib again. And you might have to at this stage just adjust things, move things along a little bit just to centre them again. Double check, um, look along the down the length. Okay. So we've reached the, the end of our of this um, this side, and again we're going to put in a a turn or twist. So it's matching actually the the, um, the start of the weave on the other side. So can you see that? The cat's just entered. That's going to be awkward. There we go. So twist over the top. Remember, if that was the bark side, if there was bark on there, that would be now on the outside again, and carry on the weave but this time going over your outermost rib let's pull that through nice and tight under the middle rib and over the outermost rib so we've actually started to do the weave and pull it nice and tight if you can you see that okay and at this stage just leave this end loose maybe another another peg or we could actually take that off now because our tail is locked so that's not that's not moving anywhere so perhaps we can just put a peg on there and that's 
that's the start of our weave. Now the reason I say leave it loose at this point rather than tucking it under and back over the back over the um, the rim is because we're actually going to insert our next rib actually in that gap underneath there. So if I show you with a bodkin, the next the first rib is going to go in that underneath there. The next rib is going to go underneath there. Do you see? Okay. And then the same on this end. It's going to go underneath there. So if we were to pull the um, pull this this weaver back it, around and over, we we'd actually lose the weave. We'd actually miss out um, a sort of a, a a part of the weave, and it would end up uneven. It would you'd end up slightly out of step. It's not the end of the world, and it can happen. You can kind of lose track a little bit as you're going along. But um, at this stage, it's good just to just to peg that there and, and start now at the other end. Okay. Okay, this time we're going to start a slightly different way. Um, and it's, and it's just really, there's no advantage or disadvantage of doing this way over the, the, the way we did before. But it's just to show, show you an example of a slightly different style. And actually if I point it out on, on this here basket, this whisket that Charlie Jones made, you can see the, the first, the tail end of the, the first weaver is actually tucked away under there. It's actually come across the front of the first three ribs. Okay, it's actually come over the first five as it happened, but yeah, it's over the front and then, then they start wrapping it around as we did before. So I'll do that this time. You remember um, previously we had the, the tail end tucked away around the back. This time it'll be actually over the front. So if I get another peg, there's our, our tail. And just hold that in place there. Okay, I'm going to line up, make sure my ribs are central. So the, the weaver's coming around the front this time. Okay, and it'll have to come inside the basket. It's a little bit fiddly, well it's very fiddly again. Like so. And it's a bit more tricky just to hold it in place, but again, the important thing is that we're actually gonna bring the, the weaver around the back of the, the rim, and then over the, the first rib, over the front of the first rib. Sorry, can you see that? Uh, is that coming across on the camera? There we go. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's it's the same same principle. So around the over the front of the crossing over the front of the first outermost rib, round the back, in between the outermost and the middle one. Crossing over the front of the middle one. Over the top, round the back of the rim, and then crossing it over the front of the outside rib. I'm just using my fingers just to hold everything in, in place because it is quite, it's very, very fiddly to start with. Okay, and then, so we've got our, our weaver here coming over the back of the, pegs in the way, over the back of the, the hoop or the rim, over the front of this outermost rib around the back of the hoop, in between the outermost and middle, over the front of the middle one. It's just as well I've got small fingers, I don't know quite how, I'd probably have to make bigger baskets if I have bigger fingers. Okay, so we've crossed over and over the around the back of the hoop, in between the, the middle and the outermost, crossing over the outermost, and we're back here. Okay, so that's just a, a slightly different start really. I can take my peg off now because that tail is now locked in place. Maybe that's why it was done that way because it's actually, it does lock quite easily. So keep it nice, keep all the weaving nice and tight as well. So we can now start our weave just as we did before. So over the back of the hoop, remembering to put in that, that twist. I do it like that, there we go. Remembering to put in that, that little twist um, coming in between, around the back of the outermost. And there we go, over the middle one. And around 
the back of your third rib. So under, over, under, over the hoop, around the back, and then do it the opposite way. So again, we, we put in that twist. Can you see that? So the twist there just ensures that if we had bark on the, it would be on the outer part of the basket. So over your outermost rib, like so. Under the middle one. Keep it nice and tight if you can. And then there's your, your tail, your, 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 your weaver. So just peg that, just leave that like so and just peg it just as we did before. So we're, although we've, we started off differently at each end, just to, to demonstrate, we're actually at exactly the same point now. So from now on, the, the two sides will be working, you know, exactly the same way. There'll be no difference between uh, one end or the other end of the basket. But I think it's just to show you, demonstrate a slightly different um, start really. And, and it's, it looks a little bit different. Let's, let's just do a comparison. So there you've got the, the, the tail end of the weaver just um, across the front there. Um, and here it isn't, but it'll just be took, you know, that this will get, this tail end will get lost now, but it, it just gives a slightly different um, appearance. I think there's more than anything. Okay. And now we're ready to put in the next two ribs. Okay, this, um, this is a good time actually just to look at maybe adjusting the ribs a little bit, just to make sure that they're nice and evenly spaced. Um, that they're nice and central. We, we, we haven't done much weaving at the moment, so it's, it's a good, you know, it's not being held rigidly. The ribs are, are, are still a little bit loose and we can just shuffle them around, move them around. And the other thing to do is turn the basket over and just look along the length to see if there's any, any bulges or areas where it's, it's perhaps, um, you know, one side maybe is, is slightly, um, slightly more uh, bent than the other, or is just slightly out of symmetry. So it's a good time to actually look down there the basket and just double check. So I can see that this this outermost rib is is just a little bit short. So what I'm going to do is just push it down a bit more. And now that's that's just evened up the basket. I quite like to have a aim to have a sort of flat underneath if possible. So it's not the end of the world if the if the middle rib is is just pushed in a that little bit more. It just makes sure that there isn't really a, a kind of a, a definite keel on the on the underneath of the basket and it will sit nice and uh, nice and flat on a table it won't roll over um, anything like that so that's that's quite nice I'm quite happy with that we oh, getting all twisted again there we go um, and both sides again just double d double check make sure you're happy with it just push that in a little bit a little bit hopefully if you've if you've been um, forming the, the shape of the weave of the ribs um, beforehand, it should be relatively easy to to adjust them and just to see where it's perhaps a bit too much a bit too much bend or or it's a bit too too flat and needs a little bit more. But that's okay. So it's not a deep basket by any stretch, um, but it's quite a nice. It'd be quite a nice shape. Okay, there we go. Right, so we're going to add our next two ribs. What I tend to do actually is, is start to look for slightly shorter ribs that we, we would have prepared yesterday. And we're going to do the same thing. We're actually going to bend them into form the, the shape that we want. Um, I'm just finally trying to find the outside of that. There we go. So exactly, exactly the same thing. Um, you can because we've, we've put three ribs in now, we, we, we obviously haven't got a sort of template, so it's quite good just to just to kind of use the basket now, because it's, it's, it's beginning to form its the shape that we want. Just use the basket as a, to give you an idea of uh, where you need to perhaps do a little bit of uh, bending as we did before. So I'll just perhaps do some something there. See, that's already... That's a little bit thinner anyway, so just the process of, of putting it into the basket just now has actually you know, begun to, to, to bend it to the shape we want. There 
okay, that looks pretty good. That looks fairly even, I think that's all right. Let's try it again in the in the basket. And we can this time we can because we're doing them in pairs, we can actually use this one we've just bent as a sort of template for its opposite number. Yeah, that's that's pretty good actually. So we'll find another slightly shorter rib. Okay. And these are all going to be trimmed as well, so it doesn't matter if they're if they're too long. That's that's absolutely fine. So it's going to be about there. And again, I can feel that that's actually just resisting a bit. So I'm going to trim that back with my knife as we have been doing. So it's right about there. And I can I can actually see that is is a little bit thinner. You know the, the thickness is, is greater there than, than here so I can that's as much a visual check than anything but I can certainly feel it as we're trying to bend it to shape so just trim off a little bit off the back okay I've um these are the shape now I want uh, just a little bit of adjustment there these are the shape I want for our basket so the next thing I need to do is to perhaps just trim them up I certainly need to taper them but I'll just um trim them to to length um, that ends not too bad actually this end is perhaps a bit too long um, but let's uh, let's trim it up so this is quite important this is um, we need to put a taper on these and you'll see precisely why in a minute and the taper allows it to allows the rib to slide under one of the weavers that we've we've just put into the basket um, I, I would taper it both width ways, okay, and also to the thickness, along the thickness of the rib as well. Um, and also, and this is probably as important, is just to take off the corners as well. So when you taper it, you, you end up with something which is approximately square, but you don't want those sharp edges. I've, I've said this several times now, but uh, finally, here so it can be you know it's a quite a fine point but try and avoid any any sharp corners because as you're sliding the the weave the, the rib in it will actually potentially tear and slice through the weaver that we spent so much time trying to to put into the basket so that's that's the first end that's maybe just a little bit more there so let's try putting this one in and um, actually do it at this end so it's easy to film now it's actually going to go underneath there. Okay, your, your first, uh, your so your next rib is going to go underneath that um, that weaver where it's come over the top of the basket. So this is where a, a, a bodkin of some kind does come in handy because you might find you can actually just slide it under. It's but it's quite a tight fit really, and and it's. If, if you'd file, find that down too much, it would actually not be strong enough to push through. But a bodkin here will will help you out quite a lot. So I'm going to use this basket maker's bodkin. It's a little bit sharp on the edges, but um, I think we'll be will be okay. Um, I'm also left-handed, so this is this is me working right-handed. And the bod what the bodkin will do is just just wiggle, give you a bit of a Give it a bit of a wiggle, but it just opens up that um, that weaver there, or the space underneath it, so that now you have actually got a just give it a little bit of a wiggle, and now you've actually created a little bit of a space that you can actually slide the um, the rib into. So let's give that a go. If I can recover the the rib, there's the tapered end, and now hopefully it should be possible. Let's perhaps just do it in between the. Just take it a little bit fiddly there and push that right the way through. Okay, so that's now going to be locked in place, and it's only because you've tapered it down that I've been able to insert that. And you can actually push it a reasonable way in. Okay, and that's held firmly now. So now we're going to do exactly the same but at the other end.
Now obviously, um, because I've, I've slotted that in there, I've not been able to taper it down, but I think it's probably a good time to actually trim it down anyway. And then very carefully, in fact, you, to be honest, you, you can actually take this out. Let, let's take, let's just work out where it's gonna taper to. So it's gonna taper to about that point. So we'll trim that with the secateurs. And carefully not trying to chop my finger off. Okay, and because we've we've now put that that ribbon at that end, it should actually be possible to slide it out and then reinsert it again afterwards. But the important thing is is to put a nice a nice taper on this end. So again, sl uh, slice down, keeping the Try and keep the knife steady and the, pull the, uh, the rib towards you. Get a nice strong cut then. Um, and thin it down as well. So we've made it narrower and we're also making it a little bit thinner. That's probably about enough. And just, just take off those corners, those sort of sharp edges. That we, and that'll hopefully stop, reduce the chance of it actually tearing into the weaver. Okay, let's give that a go. That's just a little bit thick there, maybe. Okay. So we'll do as we did before. We'll slide one end under here. Because we've actually we've put the weave up, also the rib already under there, it's actually it's just opened up that, that weaver a little bit more. Um, we need to do the same again at this end. And again, it's quite, at the moment, shall I turn this around so you can... So we're working from the same end. And I can do this left-handed as well. So you just use your your bodkin or the end of a spoon, as I say. Um, and ideally, what I want it to do is actually come up in between in that gap there. Okay, I don't really want it to tuck in under there. I just want it to come out uh, the the rib to actually slide out. Probably about there actually. So that's the path. We want the um, the rib to take, and that's the advantage of a bodkin because it kind of gives you a allows you to sort of form the path that your your rib is going to take. So I'll just put that down. Now, hopefully, that should now slide in like so. There we go. So we've we've got another rib in now and you can you can you know bend that and form that a little bit now just to make sure it does fit in with the, the shape of the rest of your basket so you don't want too much uh, poking out the top because we're going to trim that anyway but obviously if, it, if it's gone too sh if you've trimmed it too short then it, it won't actually reach the end of the basket so now having done that side we do the op the opposite side at the same time so we're put, building up our ribs in um, in pairs but we put in the next the, the the fifth rib so three this one and this one are now um, sort of in symmetry with each other and so we always put ribs in in pairs now we can carry on with the weaving so we've actually got another rib we can now weave around so I'll carry on at this end so just following on from where it was left off last time so we here we've we've brought it over the rib number three in this case, well, this outer, outer rib. And now we've got another one we can actually weave around. So this time it will go underneath there. Um, when it reaches the end, we put in that twist. Okay, I can see our weavers are drying out quite a lot. We'll, I think we'll be all right. So put in the twist and then carry on weaving. Good name for, for a film, I think. Carry on weaving. So, round the back of the hoop, remember to put in that twist, and then you can go over, under, over. So it's just start to split out a little bit, so we'll just be a bit careful there. Over, under. And there it's, it's just gone a little bit fragile, so I'm a bit 
just a bit nervous it might snap but if it does it's not the end of the world I'll um, I'll show you how you can deal with that I think that's probably gonna oh no we might be all right let's see how we get on as long as there's some continuity of in the fibers it will just about hold on but I think that one might be about to go yeah so what I'll do is I'll snip that off and um, work from the other side and then I'll show you how to join up um, weavers which is um, which at some point you're going to have to do but this is as good a time as any to to um, to leave that there so I'll just um you know, just cut it off with the secateurs there we go and we'll start working on the opposite end so remember we work we do the same thing at each end um, we'll, we'll weave in um, at one end weave in at the other um, and then having put in um, having put in the ribs um, we can then continue on on with the weave at each end let me let me go back to this side now I think it's partly because it's um, it's so dry sorry is it working inside sorry working inside it's 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 really dry so it does everything does dry out very quickly so over so we've gone over that third rib underneath the new rib remember to put in your twist around the back of the hoop and then over our new rib and carry on carry on with the weave So we go under, over the middle. Like so, put it nice and tight as well if you can. Under, over. Um, this time we're actually going to put the twist in after. Okay, so it comes, so it comes up over the, that final rib around the back of the hoop over the top and then and just pull this through then you put the twist in yeah so your the bark side if there was bark on on there it would always be facing on the the outside okay um, if it does start to dry out or it feels like it's getting a little bit brittle then it's sometimes easier to actually pull always to, to pull the um the weaver all the way through and then sort of push it back through so rather than trying to do too much at once too many too much sort of kind of twisting and uh, adjusting at once just, just perhaps just just do one rib at a time and then it's, i suppose it is putting putting it under less strain okay so now we're we're effectively at the point we were before we inserted these these two outermost outermost ribs so now we're going to repeat that process um, but i think I'll, first i'll show you how to join two weavers together i think this is probably a, a, an opportune moment to do that so just a peg there to hold that in place and let's look at this side and joining two together okay Okay, we're going to join um, a new weaver onto onto this one where it, where it actually actually broke. Uh, it's it's a little bit. Normally, I would I would want to be add, adding weavers when we've we've got more ribs to, to work with, but um, in this case, obviously, we've got no choice. So, um, what I'll do is I'll show you how to insert a weaver, a new weaver, and how to hide the the, the ends. Uh, took away the ends now normally I'd want a few more ribs to, to work with as I say but I think um, you know through necessity here we're gonna we're gonna try and uh, join th these two so what I want to do is for ha to have the new weaver follow the same path that the the previous weaver would have done so let's um let's imagining imagine this this weaver was carrying on in it in the path it was taking so it would come under that that rib there and we're just going to sort of follow it back really like so and what i'm going to do is actually just slide it slide the two together so that they are actually overlapping and what i want to do is to be able to tuck that end underneath underneath that that rib and lock it away 
it's, it's quite fiddly when um, this early on when all the ribs are very closely spaced together but we'll, we'll try and get that done now it might be that you need to use a, a bodkin or something just to be able to to slide that to create a space for that end to, to tuck under in fact let's turn it over perhaps it'll be easy to, to see so we're trying to get that tucked under under there there we go that's so that's hidden at, um, out of sight now we have got a little bit of a, a sort of tag here so at the end once we've made the basket I may well trim that back um, but I want to leave it for now I just wanted to, to help lock this new weaver in place uh, and then once it's all held together and it's it's much stronger we can perhaps look at trimming off those little little tags there so now we can carry on as if our original weaver was whole And just to start with, I'll try not to pull it too hard because I don't want it to, to unlock. I don't want it to slide back out um, from underneath the ribs there. It won't be an issue later on, but just for now. So carrying on, it comes over the top as before. Putting your little, your little twist there. Can you see that? So we twisted that. And now we'll just carry on following the same process that we did before on the opposite side. Once we reach the end here, we'll be ready to put in our next two ribs. nice and tight and then just leave that leave that loose for now and peg it so it's, it's held out of the way there we go so now we're ready to put in our next two ribs rib um, rib six and seven are now in um, put in exactly the same way formed to shape initially uh, use the bodkin if necessary just to to slide them in you can see that's quite it gets quite tight there so the bodkin does help to to create a path for them to to go into um, and now we can continue on with the, the weave so exactly the same as before now at this point you, you can actually if you want you can wrap the the weaver twice around the um, around the hoop if you want just to give yourself a little bit more space which is what I've done there and I'll do the same on the opposite side so it's symmetrical so our, which means our, our extra rib now is, is going into, into form part of the weave. There is a lot of repetition actually. Once you, once you start putting in the, the ribs, um, it's exactly the same process uh, time and time again. Uh, under over under over and again you might find that, that the weaver does start to might start to split especially if it, if it does dry out so but just push it all together and tighten it up and it will you'll hardly even know it was it has split and you you still keep in the strength as well in the weaver even though it, even though there's a split there so up to the last rib and this time we put the twist in there and then I'll go twice around the hoop and it'll become obvious particularly when we when we do actually start to use weavers with bark on the um, the effect of, of putting that twist and you'll see visually straight away that it's it's keeping the the bark side always on the outside of the basket you there's I mean in practice you, you could leave it have the bark side on the inside but actually it I guess it's you know aesthetically it's it's not quite as nice, but also it's the bark will flake away a little bit as you use the basket. So particularly for for laundry or something like that, you don't want little bits of wood or or wood or bark or whatever getting uh, caught up in your socks and things like that. So we've reached the end there. Now we'll go over to the the other side and do exactly the same again. Okay, 
Okay, so we'll just bring that weaver up and over around our new rib. And around once. And if you do get these any of these little whiskers forming, I, I would probably leave them unless they're really getting in the way. So this one might be getting get in the way. So just just peel it right back. So pair it off. Um, probably better not to use a knife actually than in that case. Just peel it off that way. We go this time again. We'll go twice around. Put in the twist. Um, that might get in the way, so I'll just just pair that off. Same again there. Put in our twist and carry on. Exactly as before. A chance to adjust the ribs, the spacing of the ribs, especially at this stage before you've completed too much of the weaving. So I do every now and again just. Just double check the space and just pull them out a little bit. There's our centre one, so keep it nice and symmetrical if you can. We've um, we've been preparing all the all the extra ribs that we've been adding exactly the same as before, so. Uh, trimming them down, tapering them down at the ends so they'll slide in, maybe even shortening some of them um, because they were a little bit too long. And uh, I'm just using my bodkin again just to create a path for the rib to slide into. So here's rib number eight. So slide on, try again. Slide into there. And let's go to the other end. Uh, just trying to work out where the weaver's going to go. It's going to go under there. So and here again, I might need to use. Oh no, we're, we're good. We don't need to use the, the bodkin. Just slide that in like so. So that's number eight. And I'll try and. I don't want the basket to flare out too much, so I've pushed this this last weaver in, almost so it, it it's it's sat right underneath the um, the rim. Um, the, sometimes you can end up with a basket which actually bulges out at the sides, which you know might be useful. But in this case, we want to keep it fairly, fairly even in shape. Okay, um, and finally the the last rib to go in. I might not need the bodkin here. Just slide that slide it down like so. Now you might be wondering about all these these ends of the, the ribs as well and um, they'll all get trimmed off once we finish the basket so that's usually the last thing i, I actually do uh, just try and carefully put this this last rib in without breaking it so it'll go underneath there if we can like so okay that's nice so that's our basket in terms of the, the structural elements, the ribs, that's all, all done now. We can just carry on weaving and um, we won't be adding any more ribs. So we'll just carry on by adding new weavers as and when required and, uh, and build up the rest of the, the middle of the basket. Let's just keep spacing those out evenly as well, like so. And in a minute, I think the next weaver that we add will um, will go to using the, the ones with bark on that we prepared yesterday. There's, a, there's that twist there. this one out so I've done sorry I've, I've, I've done something wrong here I think actually I've missed out um, a bit of the weave I can straight away I can see we've, we should have come there we go we, we should have come actually between the the hoop and that last rib like so and and then so it's quite tight for putting in that, that twist there isn't it 
So it's good to it's quite good to get into a rhythm of doing things, but then it's very easy then just to see you know, miss out that you might have made a mistake or missed something out. So you should um should just shouldn't switch off completely, although it is actually a very therapeutic thing to do weaving. And again, this weaver's all, you know, it has split, but I'm not, I'm not bothered about that. It will tidy itself up. We'll, uh, we'll lose the split eventually. Now, this is probably quite a good point to, to stop. Now, I could well carry on with this weaver right the way to the end, but I think by the time I've brought it over the, the back of the rim, um, and, and, and started weaving the other way. I don't think it will actually get very far. And what I'd like to have is is as many ribs as possible um, in order to, to lock the next weaver onto. So if you recall before, we we uh, we only had a, a few. We only had three ribs, I think, to to lock the um, the weaver onto when we when we when we had to put a new one in. Um, so this time, what I might do is actually trim it back about there. And then we can lock it, the new weaver, under one, two, three, four, potentially five, five or six uh, ribs, which is much more gives you a much stronger uh, connection. So I'll just trim this off with our secateurs. Trim it around the back, and I'm trimming it actually as quite close to the rib, so there won't be much of a a tag there um, to trim off at the end. That will be nicely hidden. Um, so try and trim your your weavers right up against the right up against the uh, the rib there. That'll be covered over with the, the next weaver, and it'll be be nice and hidden. So we'll just carry on again on the other side, exactly as before. This time, hopefully not making that little mistake there. So this this weaver has to tuck in right underneath there. That's quite a tight tight gap. So there's not a lot of room really for your your twist, but. No, I think I think you'll get it in there. There we go. And then push the the rib right up against it and tighten it up. This often happens with a small basket is that you don't have a lot of space to um, to work in. So the ribs are compared with a larger basket, the ribs are actually quite close together, particularly at the at the very start. Okay, and we'll probably find we might find the same with this one that we actually have to just trim it a little bit short. It might it might come up and reach over as a bit more, but yeah, I'll trim this one exactly the same, and then we can we can start the next uh, next weaver just by joining it in there, nice and tight up against the rib. Okay. Next week. Okay, for our next weavers, um, I think we'll go over to, to start using the ones with with bark on the on the outside, um, and you you join these in exactly the same way as we did earlier on. So this time you'll see that there's a few more ribs we can we can anchor this or lock this weaver onto. So the, the technique I suppose is, is to try and sort of slide it slide it into place like so and it just then tucks on underneath that rib um, perhaps we'll just pull it through a little bit more um, I'm gonna again try and slide it underneath there so we'll just pull a bit more through again sort of it's quite tricky to do but you can see we've just about got it locked in there and I'll trim that one off at the end. So this weaver will, you can see this is quite a long one actually, so we'll have to uh, just be careful we don't get it caught on anything as we're going through. And and as I say, there's no real difference. It's, it's, it, it's your choice as to how you want the basket to be finished, either with or without the bark showing. The um, Sometimes the bark does flake off a little bit as we're weaving weaving it in so you might see it it just crack a little bit but I, I don't think that's a, a problem it doesn't it doesn't really flake off a great deal I 
And I'm just helping it, helping the weaver through really, not 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 pulling it hard, but just help, just guiding it through with my with both hands, just to help reduce the chance of the the bark pulling off um, and or the, the the weaver actually splitting. So again, same exactly the same as before. We'll go over the top. We'll put in that twist there, and you'll start to see it, it does actually make the um it does it does look quite pretty actually when it's done so I'm just pulling it through first before before I put the twist in so it'll go like like that you see okay and now I can continue weaving this in exactly the same as before and you can actually see the bark is on the outside now and the the white surfaces will always be on the inside And particularly with longer weavers, you do find you have to, it's a little bit awkward just to keep feeding them through. So at this time, at this point in the basket, I tend to actually use, sometimes I actually cut these shorter and, and just keep joining them. I think it's a, there's an advantage to having a very, the longest possible weaver at the start because you want to build up that, those ribs and not have too many joints and connections to have to put in. But as you go along, further along, it's easy enough then just to keep adding. You don't have to add any more ribs, so you can just keep joining up the weavers as you shorter weavers as you go along. So I'm just helping to guide it through, not trying to bend it too much. Every now and again, there'll be a little kink. That's where it's dried out a little bit too much as I've been working, and it'll just just kink. But as long as there's continuity of in the fibres, as I've said several times now it will it will all stay strong in fact I think I will actually cut this short um, cut this this weaver a bit short it's getting a little bit awkward and there's there's just a little kink there so maybe that's as good a place as any to, to cut it shorter and it's a bit more manageable now With a bigger basket where you've got more space to to work, you, you do have um, you can use the longer weavers more. But here, that's very very tight, really. Now I can't see the um, the opposite side, but hopefully the camera's picking up the actual finish that we're getting and the contrast as well. I quite like the contrast as much as anything between the. The pail. Let's have a look. look. Yeah, and the um, and the bark. So that's quite nice. So we reach the end again. We're not adding any more ribs, so we can just carry on, carry on weaving. There's our twist. Okay, we've we've skipped ahead a little bit because um, we've you know the weaving is fairly fairly repeated. Once you get into the rhythm of it, it's um, you know it's just the same thing. Working your way towards the middle, working the, some on each side at the time. Eventually, you you reach the point where you're ready to join up the the two sides. So there's a, a gap of about probably two two weaves across, I reckon. Um, as as we worked as we've been working as I've been working, I'm. Some of the hazel has just dried out a little bit because we're working inside and you know it's a dry heat um, and what's happened is the hazel just become a little bit too sort of brittle so the bark in, in places has peeled off. Now what I'd probably do with with this maybe here and there and it's particularly actually where we've had to go over a, a tight radius and, it, and it's you know there might be a little bit of a weakness in the, in the bark and I think what it is also is that the time of year we've been cutting the hazel I, I find that if you cut it really late on in the autumn, beginning of winter, which in in the UK is is sort of late November time, then you 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 generally don't find that happens. I think at this time of year, it's, uh, which is uh, March time, 
Um, it's just the hazel itself is just be beginning to get a little bit more kind of active because of the, the warmth and the extra light. And I think that actually weakens the um, this outer bark. Um, so it does tend to peel off a bit. But what I'll do is I'll just wait until the whole basket has dried and then just um, nip these off with a, a knife or a pair of secateurs and it'll just look a lot neater. I mean, there'll be places where you won't have the bark, but I'm, I'm reasonably happy with, with how it turned out, um, certainly underneath. I think that's that's quite a nice nice finish. So we'll put in the last weaver and then uh, do a little bit of trimming just to, to tidy the whole thing off. Okay, now again, I'm, uh, I'm gonna try and join up um, this weaver just as I've been doing before. Um, I think it's, it's quite quite useful if you can try and make your, your new weaver approximately the same width as the one you're trying to join up with because then it'll, um, it'll look neater, um, the, the join will be a little bit more hidden as well. Um, so I've, I've trimmed this one down just a little bit just to make it the same, the same width as, as the weaver that I'm trying to continue on from. I'm just going to quietly slide that under there, we just pull it through and it under. And there isn't quite as much space now to do that, you know, that, that action I showed you before where you pull it um, backwards and forwards to slide it under. We haven't got, really got the space to do that, so I'm just having to, to work it through. Um, and now we'll just continue with this last weaver, hopefully. It will be our last one. And again, I, I can see that the bark here is just, you know, although we've, we've had the, uh, the hazel soaking in water as I've been working it, it's just very quickly drying out, so the, the bark is flaking a little bit. The hazel itself is just getting a little bit too brittle, really, but I think it'll be it'll be fine. We can always add a, a you know one more weaver if there, if there is a, a gap, or this one does does break. And again, still still trying to keep that that twist as well, you know, just to. Keep it consistent. So I'll go. I'll work from this side now, so you can see. I just lost it. Twist there. Okay. Now, hopefully, maybe we'll go across once. Back and then it will join up with this this weaver, which is the is the end of of this side of the, of the basket. And what you find as well at this this stage is you know everything's that little bit tight again, so there isn't a lot of space really to to work in. Things are getting very close, so I do tend to just pair apart the, the weavers if there isn't enough space for them to slide in against each other then just you know just use your, your fingers just to pair the uh, them apart and give yourself a little bit more working room and this will be the case regardless of the size of the basket you'll always find this this last bit just like a little bit more awkward Same again here, it's just getting a little bit, it's getting a little bit close in, but just pair them apart a little, the weavers all apart a little bit and there should be space. You'd be surprised how much you can actually create a bit more working space. There we go. So that weaver will now go down that gap. Let's see if it doesn't break. 
Okay, so hopefully the final time we twist it. I'm just seeing which which way I want to twist it because we're right in the middle. You know, you can go to twist one way or the other depending on which side you think it is it's best fitting. Perhaps the point. Yeah, it's really really close in so you can use your bodkin sometimes even just to prise them apart just to give yourself a little bit more room. And also you can see I'm just helping the the, the hazel around and it help, just kind of use your fingers and thumbs just to sort of help it round the around the rim there, it does help prevent it from snapping or getting too too frayed. Yeah, I think we'll use the uh, bodkin just to give ourselves a bit more space there. But hopefully, I think this will be the last time we need to feed it through this gap. So we'll see, we might need another another weaver, but I'm too concerned. Oh, no, it did go there. So what I'll do is um, I'll just join up one more. Just go work back a little bit more, maybe from here, add one more thinner weaver, and then and then we'll just carry on to the end. is quite thin at this end that might might help us I'll just um I'll just trim it up a little bit just so it does match the the weaver we're working from really when there's, when there's no space to to work it's quite it's just quite, quite, quite fiddly I'll just trim that one back then Helps to open up that little gap there. Let's pray it's long enough. That looks good. Just about, just about make it. Just 
just a little bit of space there to work the weaver back the other way to join up with that one. Nope, we missed one out. Sorry. There, that's it. Gonna be close. I think we're just about on target. And there we go. So just a little bit more, just to be able to tuck it under there. Just lock that under there. Okay. And that is the end of our weave. Okay, well, I'm, I'm gonna, just gonna tidy it up a little bit. Um, just see if there's any little whiskers or, or tags which are, are showing. Uh, just use my secateurs. Um, and you could use a, a sharp knife as well for this. Um, there's a little, there's the end of our tail from when we started weaving. It's a little bit, a bit of bark shown there. Um, maybe just one of the, two of these, these little tags inside. There's a couple there. Okay, um, and there's our, our basket. No, it's not quite finished. There's another little bit of bark there. I'll just trim that off as well. Not quite finished because we want to tidy up the um, the tops of the ribs as well. So uh, what I'll do is I'll I'll cut the um, the three outer ribs flush to the rim. In fact, let's have a, a look at this one. So. Um, it's quite nice if you, if you if you cut the three outer ones a little bit flusher to the rim and then have the middle three just a little bit more proud. Um, perhaps I'll show you um, show you Charlie's as well. So they've, he's got more ribs um, on this one, but you can see he's, he's generally trim the them so they kind of take you know they 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 slope up to the the middle three or in this case five ribs. Um, so we'll we'll. We'll do that. We'll have those, these ones a little bit shorter on the outside, and then the middle three just a little bit, a bit more proud. I'll try it from the other side. Same again this side. And just a little bit, a little bit higher. We'll come in from work from this side again. And then, uh, and then yeah, you could just. Um, Depends how tidy you want to be, but I, I probably will just trim off these little whiskers. Maybe as, let it dry out a little bit, and then it might shrink a, a, a little bit as well. So uh, not too much. It doesn't actually. It's surprising how little it does shrink because the, um, the 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 rim and the the ribs themselves probably won't won't change shape a great deal. 
Um, the weavers themselves might shrink a little bit, but that help, does help to tighten up the basket. So I think that's the end of our, uh, our whisket, uh, whisket making. And, um, and yeah, this is a, an example of a traditional split hazel basket. So there you have it, my friends. That is a wrap for this mammoth tutorial from Lewis. Lewis, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much too. This though. guy's been an absolute trooper. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, we've actually filmed this over a two day period. Uh, there's a lot of kind of uh, logistics involved and preparation and so forth. Um, as I also mentioned, we had to retreat inside to Lewis's abode because we've had torrential rain pretty much all day. Yeah. <laughs> it's been like heavy winds. So yeah, it wasn't a great environment to be filming in, uh, but Lewis has stuck through and shown this in complete detail, the entire process he uses to make these wonderful, wonderful baskets. Now, a few things to uh, mention also. Uh, number one, there is a timestamp below to the relevant sections throughout this entire process. If you want to jump to a particular section, then just click on the timestamp below and that will take you to that relevant part of the video. Second thing to also mention that Lewis actually does this as a profession. You know, he teaches uh, professionally uh, throughout the UK, at uh, events, privately, etc. So if this is something you're maybe considering, because hazel, um, split hazel weaving uh, and basket making is, is not a common thing, is it? No, it, it's, it's, um, it's very, very rarely practiced as a, as a skill because it, it does take a long time. Um, but I think, you know, it'd be great to think that people are going to get interested and, and, and hopefully go away and, and start using hazel for, for, for making these lovely baskets. And this is the thing, this leads us on to two very important things. Number one, um, in Lewis's own words, privately, when we were arranging this entire meetup, is he really genuinely wanted to inspire a lot of you out there uh, to bring this craft back to life and to inspire you to have a go at making one yourself. Mm. One caveat with doing this stress again is very important. But just make sure whatever you're doing in terms of uh, sourcing your hazel, make sure you're doing it responsibly. Um, I think you'd agree. It's just yeah. a, an extremely important thing. So don't just go and hack in hazel uh, to make this. Make sure you're following the advice that Lewis outlined earlier on in this video. But the key thing is, is not to let that stop you and to make sure you go out and give this a go. Now, another component to that is, as I mentioned, Lewis teaches this professionally. So if you're in the UK, even possibly abroad, and you're able to uh, arrange a few of you to get together and you want to invite Lewis down as a guest teacher, um, then what I'm gonna do, needless to say, is put a link below to Lewis's website and Instagram. And would it be okay for people to get in touch with you? Of course, yeah, that would yeah. be brilliant, thank you. And um, so please, you know, please do give him a shout if you know, you've got a, a meetups and uh, group gatherings, etc. and you feel uh, Lewis will be a, a valued contributor uh, to that for the day or even a few days um, in terms of teaching or exhibiting and so forth. So if you've got any questions or queries, feel free to give Lewis a shout or put links below. In relation to those links to his website and Instagram, as I mentioned once again, Lewis does this professionally. Now he's taken two entire days out and also walking me as a guest into his abode. Um, and all I would ask from you is just one thing, and that is if in any way, shape or form, you've got any form of value from this video, all I ask for you is two small things. Number one, I'll put a link below to Lewis's Instagram. Please do give him a follow. He updates you regularly on all the different goings on he has. As I mentioned before, he works in and around a wood, uh, woodland environment on a day-to-day -day basis, both professionally and in his spare time. So please do give him a follow on Instagram down below. It will mean a lot to me uh, that you do that as your way of saying thank you to Lewis. Secondly, I'm gonna put a link below to Lewis's website. On his website, you can find a plethora of information about all the many different things that Lewis does. You can also get more detailed information about the uh, Split Hazel teaching uh, and the courses and demonstrations and events uh, that Lewis is uh, attending and running throughout the year. Uh, also, you can contact him privately through that as well. And also you have his a store on there. So obviously the different weird that he's actually selling. Uh, do you take commissions? Um, I do. Or, um, yeah, by all means, contact me and, and we'll see if, it, if it's the right thing um, for me to, for, to do for you. Yeah, this is not a common thing. You don't see this too often. Mm -hmm. So when you do have the opportunity uh, to kind of like claim one of these, it's like, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a great opportunity. So like I said, I'm gonna put a link below to his website and there's all this information on there should you want to go check that out. And like I said, it's just our way of saying thank you to Lewis for taking so much time out and also voluntarily sharing all this information. Trust me, he has left nothing out of this video. He shared everything. Um, and he's taken many years to kind of refine his own skill and continuously hone in that in. 
So like I said, Mina Awards me, you can check out his Instagram and website, uh, links below. And any parting words from yourself? Uh, all I want to say is, is thank you to you, Zed, for, for taking the time out to, to come and film. It's brilliant. It's the kind of exposure that this kind of craft really needs. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful for it. And I think, you know, I'm hoping a lot more people will, will take it up and will, will give this, this, uh, these skills a, a, a new life. That'd be brilliant. It's, it's, you know, one thing we spoke a lot about off camera is, especially in the UK, in parts of the UK, especially in the South East, Hazel is just everywhere. It's just everywhere. And yeah. apart from you know, making the odd pot hanger, <laughs> cooking my food right when I'm outdoors, I've never really had a use for it. And now all of a sudden, like, my mind's just been blown. Like, what you can do, because even thinking outside the box, you're using it for callers and a whole bunch of stuff. That's right. You know, just the way you were processing the hazel, because I've never seen it in person. Mm. Ironically, even filming this was the first time I've seen a process in so much detail. Uh, and it literally blew my mind. Because like I said, hazel is everywhere. In the woodland that I'm building a base camp, it's just everywhere. Um, so you've definitely given me a lot of food for thought um, mm -hmm. and stuff. So once again, a sincere thank you, Lewis. Uh, I really do mean that. Finally, like I said, links below to Lewis's website and Instagram. Mean the world to me to, for you to go check that out. There's timestamps below uh, to all the relevant sections throughout this video. So please do go click on that if you want to jump to a particular section. Lewis, like you said from the very beginning, his intention, sole intention, was to inspire you to have a go at this yourself. If you have any questions or queries, you can go to his website and contact him through there. And I really do appreciate you watching all the way through. And so, Lewis, thank you once again. And as always, guys, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. From Lewis and myself, Z Outdoors, peace out.